Hello, and welcome back to the Alexander Society. I'm your host, amateur historian with heavy unaddressed biases, Derek, joined by my friend and co-host, slightly more uh, slightly more amateur, slightly less historian, but much less biased, Tim. Derek, we both know I'm biased as fuck. You're less biased than me. <laughs> Fair. I'm doing pretty good tonight, Derek. How about yourself? I'm doing all right. I've got... Like I told you before we started recording, I've got so much energy tonight, I have no idea why. Then my goal is to get you shit faced tonight, right? Yeah. Yeah, let's uh let's let's get some liquor into us cuz uh cuz <laughs> actually I'm, I'm just getting off because of my weird fucky schedule at work. I'm actually working like a full 40 hours now. Nice. Like 5 days, 40 hours, 12 to 8. And uh, it's kicking my ass, but I like the paychecks. So, Derek, what are you drinking tonight? Oh, hell, what am I drinking? So, my for my beer, I've got some Heirloom Rustic Ales Cafe, which is a, a petit French-style beer, which is, it's a coincidence I happened to pick this one while we're on a French topic. I didn't even, it didn't even occur to me. Um... But it's a 3.3% alcohol by volume, and it is brewed by Heirloom Rustic Ales in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And it's uh, it's all right. It's been pretty all right so far, the few sips I've taken. It's got that same sort of weird flavor that like a Belgian beer does, but it's not like super overwhelming. Like like if you ever had like, a, what's it called, Blue Moon or whatever, um, that stuff, it's that same kind of flavor, but it's like, a lot lighter. Um, I thought you hated Blue Moon. Yeah, I fucking hate Blue Moon. But you're okay with this beer? <laughs> yeah, because it's not it it's not awful. It doesn't it doesn't feel like it's leaving a residue on my tongue. And uh, the alcohol I've got today is going to be some New Amsterdam uh, peach vodka, thirty five percent alcohol, seventy proof. Yeah, I've had a I've had a little bit of New Amsterdam stuff before. Um, I'm pretty sure I liked it. I probably didn't dislike it or I would have remembered, but we're going to have to take an extra shot at the beginning for, or the show. Just oh, heads up. Oh, what's that? Jimmy Buffett died. Oh shit. Yeah. Jimmy Buffett did die. A drinking legend, man. I don't know if he drank a lot, but he's a legend to the drinking community. You know? Oh, you know, that man was downing like three tequilas a night. Come on. Or three, three margaritas a night. That's what I meant. I know, but like. We got to honor Jimmy Buffett, even though this will come out like two weeks after his, three weeks after his death. Uh, Tim, what are you drinking? So this week I'm drinking Lemon Slice from Prairie Artisan Ales. And it tastes just like if you made a lemon ale. Like, you know, uh, ginger ale? It tastes like a lemon ale, like on that. Like, it tastes delicious. Yeah, that shit actually sounds amazing. And then for my liquor tonight, I am drinking Blackheart Spiced Rum. Uh, it's... Forty six point five percent. Yeah, we uh we drank this shit religiously when we were res- like our respective times at NEO, our overlapping group of friends, and whatever we drink together. We so Derek, we're picking up where we left off on the first part of the French Revolution and Napoleon Bonaparte. Why don't you give us our rules? Yeah, so here in this illustrious society of ours, we abide by an ever changing set of rules. Rule number. With no consistency, whatever, whatsoever. No, absolutely no consistency. We have, we are, we are playing this entire thing by the seat of our pants. Uh, rule number one: Every time there's a big ass battle, we're gonna take a sip. Every time something bad happens to Austria, we take three sips. God, that's gonna happen a lot. That that is actually gonna happen a lot. Yeah. Every time a new coalition war begins. What are we going to do, Tim? We're going to take a motherfucking shot! Speaking of shots... We're taking our beginning of the episode, then another one for good old Jimmy Buffett. Yeah, pour one out, write down our gullet for Jimmy Buffett. Prost. Cheers. (sighs) Okay. That does not hit the palate as hard as I thought it did from memory. Hmm. What is is that nutmeg I'm tasting in Blackheart? I'm so inconsistent on getting the undertones. Like 
Sometimes I don't, sometimes I do. What the hell is that undertone? All I know is it's dark. Like our souls? Like our souls, yes. It, the label on this stuff did not lie. It is very smooth. It hmm. vodka Flavored vodka usually is fairly smooth. Yeah, that's true. You ready for Jimmy Buffett's shot? Number two, let's go for it. Cheers. So, Derek, where were we left off? Yeah, so when we left off, uh, the French Revolution had ended with a grand imperial coronation. And our boy Napoleon, a former obscure artillery officer from an oppressed island nation, had just declared himself the emperor of the French nation as well as the protector of all of the young puppet republics and kingdoms that had been brought into France's sphere of influence over the course of the wars of the First and Second Coalition, the French Revolutionary Wars. It was 1804, and Napoleon was 35 years old. So immediately, in the immediate aftermath of declaring himself emperor, and then Right after that, he also uh, had himself crowned uh, king of Italy. He had his own little kingdom in northern Italy, so he could call himself the king of Italy. That that happened, too. Interesting. Sounds kind of petty, to be honest. I'll take a sip for being petty, to be honest. Like, I I love pettiness. Yeah, it's a petty ship. He's still part of the bourgeois and therefore a piece of shit. But, point one for pettiness. So, immediately after declaring himself emperor... Napoleon had to dive right back into his role as general because Britain had just broken the Treaty of Amiens a year before and war was back on with France. And then, uh, and then as, as this war begins, what, like what stage was French in? Was it known kind of like the same way it is today? Those, uh, white flag waving pieces of shits. This is back when France had the great, probably the greatest military on earth. Okay, so the the France that helped us win the Revolutionary War. Yes. I suck at timelines, so like, I knew this was before the Revolutionary War, but I didn't know if it had built up yet or not. No, this is this is after the American Revolution. Again, I'm bad with timelines. That just proves my point. This is, yeah. So, yeah. So, 1776 is the start of the American Revolutionary War, and that was back when King the the kings were still in charge. Uh, but yeah, so we, so yeah, the the timeline is we have the American Revolution that ends in 1783, and then 1789 France is close to bankruptcy. The French Revolution begins. 1799 comes around. Uh, Napoleon is in charge after all of the French Revolution stuff. The war the wars have been going on since seven the the first two wars the first two wars of the uh like the napoleonic wars started back in 1791 went through 1799 uh napoleon uh declares himself napoleon takes over becomes the first consul in 1799 or 1800 whatever um and then 1804 he declares himself emperor and now we're getting into the bulk of the napoleonic wars so now the french revolution is over okay so Britain is once again declaring war on France, and they have formed alliances with Sweden and Austria. And then later on the next year, after the war is just starting to get get going, um, they bring in Russia, and that forms the this this first of the Napoleonic Wars, the War of the Third Coalition. So, consult the rules. That is a shot, I believe. Uh, Every time a new war coalition begins. Is that what just happened? Okay. Cheers. So, in preparation for the coming conflict, Napoleon launches... He launches this giant reorganization of his entire army. Uh, He devised this new organizational structure where the army would be divided into these independent units called corps, which would make up their, a corps would be made up of 
two brigades. Each brigade would be made up of two regiments. Each regiment would be made up of, I think, four companies. And each company was made up of like 200 guys or something like that. So it came out to each corps, I think, if I, if I did my math right, about 30,000 each, each corps. And there would be like anywhere between like nine and 15 corps in the entire French army, depending on the 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 if the time period we're talking about and so we you'd and so you'd have these cores that would be made up of infantry you'd have some other a few other cores that like be specific specifically cavalry and then each core would have like a, a complement of cannons usually around 40 each and these individual cores they weren't large enough to win battles on their own but they were maneuverable and they would still be capable of holding the line if they did get into a battle. They'd be able to hold the line long enough so that other corps nearby would be able to reinforce them. And so it made Napoleon's army extremely maneuverable while still remaining extremely big. And with this new structure in place, the army was given the extremely gaudy name of La Grande Armée. Or in English, as exactly as it sounds, the Grand Army. And in at this point in 1805, the Grand Army had the the Grand Armée had about 350 thousand soldiers. Yeah, it's ridiculous. Like, like think about this. This is only a couple generations removed from the battles we were talking about in uh, the Frederick the Great series. Dang. The Seven Years' War up to that point was probably the largest war that had ever happened in European history. And most of those battles, each army was only about like 30,000 strong at the biggest. And that would, most nations only had, uh, only had an army of like 30, 40, 50,000. Like, we are now talking about, like, fucking enormous battles in a very short amount of time that this has happened. So, Napoleon, with this new new program in place, he figured that his army was now at least in a position to possibly do something that they hadn't really quite been able to do so far, which was to invade England. And because he really, really wanted to get, get Britain out of this, this war fast. And but he understood that his army would only be able to do that if they managed to get across the channel. And that is a huge if, because like I mentioned in the last episode, the Royal Navy is uh, pretty dominant. They're pretty good at what they do. Not not many. There probably aren't any navies that could really stand up to them. Uh, But Napoleon had a plan. So by this point, Spain, who was competing with Britain over some ter- like colonial territories in the Caribbean, um, had aligned itself with France. And so now France and Spain were actually allies. And uh, Napoleon, he had this plan that he would take French and Spanish naval detachments, just groups of ships, ship them over to the Caribbean and use them to harass um uh, British colonies in the Americas so that it would force Britain to uh, send some of their ships from Europe over to the Caribbean and it would kind of start to thin out uh, this line, this blockade that uh, Britain had over the over the seas around France, especially in the English Channel. And so it would give the, the French Navy more opportunities to be able to slip through the British blockade and to deal heavier blows when it came to like pitched engagements between the French Navy and the Royal Navy. Um, this plan ended up failing spectacularly because the British, the Royal Navy just destroyed the French and Spanish navies in the Caribbean, just completely wiped them out at the Battle of Cape Finisterre in july of 1805 and so that that plan was in the toilet so when that failed napoleon decided to focus on his land war instead and so he went and he invaded germany so that if he could knock out the british he could go and he could knock out the austrians they the french crossed the rhine river in september of 1805 
and I'm not I'm not fucking up. I doubled and triple checked this timeline. One month later, one month later, Napoleon had completely destroyed the Austrian army in Germany. Wait, what? In a month? In one month, at the Battle of Ulm. God damn. In a matter of two days of of engagement, the French killed or captured 60,000 Austrian troops. That sounds like three sips. Yeah, that's three sips. And France only lost 2,000 troops in the process. Jesus Christ. Uh, keep in mind, this wasn't the entire Austrian army. It was just the bulk of their army in that was in Germany. They still had smaller detachments of their armies elsewhere. And uh, this was all well and good. Austria was, for the time being, out of commission. And now Germany was pretty much under Napoleon's control. But then at the same time that the Battle of Ulm is happening, uh, the Royal Navy uh, fucked up the French once again and completely destroyed the French Navy at the Battle of Trafalgar. Have you ever... you Have you heard the... The, of the Battle of Trafalgar, it's a it's a pretty famous battle. I think I've heard of it, but not like details. Like, oh, it's this battle or uh, the Battle of Trafalgar. That's all I've heard of it. Not like the where it was, why it happened, all that. Yeah. So it's this. It was this naval engagement. It was an attempt by French and Spanish, the French and Spanish navies to uh, destroy the largest uh, detachment of the Royal Navy that was blockading Europe at that point the continental part of Europe, to try and uh, attack their flagship and knock out uh, one of their greatest commanders and kind of cripple the Royal Navy long enough to be able to give them some breathing room to potentially go and actually invade the the, the uh, English mainland. And uh, the problem was um, the British had probably, if not the greatest, then one of the greatest, like def- top five, maybe top three, greatest naval commanders in human history commanding at that battle dang and uh he he just he just blew up the french and spanish navies like he just blew them up they ceased to exist jesus christ and we actually we've actually met this guy before in the last in the first napoleon episode uh he's the guy who destroyed the french fleet at the Battle of the Nile that ended up leaving Napoleon's army stranded in Egypt. Uh, this guy's name was Horatio Nelson. I think I remember the name, but, like, you know how I am with history. It's not for, like, even when you tell me in an interesting way, my brain doesn't retain it because I'm a dumbass. Yeah, yeah, me too. I think we've established we both have pretty shitty memory for certain things. <laughs> I, at least we're on the same page. Uh, but yeah, Horatio Nelson, same guy who won the Battle of the Nile. Uh, now has won the Battle of Trafalgar, one of the most important battles in human history, probably. Um, and But unfortunately, he also died during the battle. Uh, but he did win, and he completely wiped out any French or Spanish naval presence in in the East Atlantic, basically. <laughs> um, so that is, there is now absolutely zero chance, there's no hope for Napoleon will ever be able to invade England. There is no, he will never have that opportunity again. So you're saying he got cucked by England? Uh, he gets cucked a lot, actually. He keeps on winning, but he is, <laughs> yeah. I knew he literally got cucked, but I meant metaphorically, not literally. Metaphorically and literally, yes. So, yeah, that sucks for Napoleon, sucks to suck. But the French were still at a huge advantage in Germany, which is, at the moment, the the uh, the, the main part of the war so he pressed his advantage and he entered austria itself and because they're the closest army to vienna just got wiped out at the battle of ulm the french army just marched right into vienna which is the the capital of austria and austria so austria was wasn't completely out of the war quite yet like i said they still had a few forces left over in other places and then on top of that uh, the Russians finally arrived to help reinforce them. Uh, of course. And so the French and the coalition armies, they started playing this sort of maneuvering game with one another, where they were trying to coax one another into battle on whatever land e- each of them chose. And Napoleon finally won that little game uh, when he managed to convince 
the Russians and the Austrians that his army was actually running out of supplies and was losing a lot of men uh, by abandoning. He he had set up part of his army on this place called uh, uh, oh shit, what is it called? The 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 Pratzen Heights. That's what it's called. It's just this giant fuck off hill that's like taller than everything else around it, um, and he just pulls his army off of the Pratzen Heights and sets them up next to a village called Austerlitz. And the fact that he would give up like this extremely like important strategic location uh, convinced the Russians and Austrians that, oh, his army must be really in a really bad spot. We should hit them while they're weak. And so that's exactly what they did at Austerlitz, and we get the Battle of Austerlitz out of it. And... I haven't gotten much into a lot of the battles so far, like about like the actual on the ground, what's going on. Um, I want to get into this one because I think if there's something special about this one, I'm guessing. So there are three great battles in like Western military history that are remembered as like the greatest uh, like strategic gambles that paid off because of the brilliance and the planning of the general in charge that are like like taught as like like military strategy military tactics 101 and like military schools to this day like this is shit that officers in militaries today still study um the first one is the battle of cannae when hannibal barca defeated the romans the second one is something we've covered before, the Battle of Gagamela, where Alexander defeated the Persians. I didn't think that would be counted more Western. Like, I know parts of Europe and such are considered Western, but because it was like Egypt and stuff, I didn't think it would. Uh, it's considered Western because it's part of like sort of like the Greek intellectual tradition. And so it... I, I That makes sense, I guess. I just did... Yeah. I think of different stuff when I think Western, personally. Yeah, it's not considered Western because anybody consciously made it Western, but but just because it, because of like history and cultural diffusion, it is commonly known and understood and researched in Western, in traditional Western academics and scholarship. It's not anything that was intentional. It's just what happened to kind of filtrate into uh, the like sort of European. Uh, based uh, like academic fields and studies. That kind of it, does that make sense? I don't. I don't know. Yes, it makes total sense. But yeah, the uh, the Battle of Cannae, the Battle of Gagamela, and this is the third one, the Battle of Austerlitz. This this victory is easily the greatest victory in Napoleon Bonaparte's entire career. Damn. And it's it's interesting because he based his plan for the Battle of Austerlitz off of Alexander's plan at the Battle of Gagamela. Wow. Uh, so, basically, what happened was that Napoleon, he drew the coalition army into an engagement early on the morning of December 2nd, 1805. Uh, he abandoned the Pratzen Heights, and he convinced the Austrians and the Russians that the French army was significantly weaker than it really was. Okay. Uh, and so they moved in, they occupied the hill, and so they had the high ground overlooking the French army. I have the high ground, Anakin! You underestimate my power. Now imagine if Anakin actually won that duel. This is about what's about to happen. Oh, so th- so the, this battle is essentially what ha- would have happened if Anakin had won the high ground battle. Interesting. So, so the coalition, the allies, they occupied the hill while the French forces array in the valley below. As the coalition army began to advance, Napoleon drew some of his troops away from his right flank, while at the same time he was sending off a message to another, the third corps, which was still in Austria. It was garrisoning, or it was in Vienna. It was garrisoning Vienna. He shot off a message to one of his marshals, Louis Nicholas DeVoe, and told him, get to this battlefield as soon as you can. Quick march all of your men to Austerlitz as fast as possible. And so they got off their asses, they got on the road, and they started heading, heading towards Austerlitz. Uh, the coalition, they saw that 
uh, Napoleon's right flank was weakened. And so they started sending the bulk of their forces to the French right flank in order to try and overwhelm them and kind of outflank them and roll them up. And the further they pushed down the hill towards Napoleon's right flank, more and more of their forces were being drawn away from the center of their line. It started to become stretched out in the middle. And uh, the, the, the Allies, the Austrians and the Russians, they weren't worried about it because they could look down into the valley. There's, there's no significant force of Frenchmen in, in the center, so we don't have to worry about the center as much. But at this point, it's a frosty winter morning. There's a layer of fog that was still hanging over the valley, and it was like thick fog. And so what Napoleon was doing was that as they're stretching out this uh as they're stretching out their line trying to assault uh the french right um napoleon is sending his own force under the cover of the fog right up the center up the hill right towards the coalition center and he timed it exactly perfectly so that the moment that the that the coalition center had stretched so far they stretched so far that a gap appeared in their line there's a there's a gap a couple hundred yards wide where um, the French could just walk right in and split the army in half. And as soon as that gap appeared was when not only did the not only did the French reach the top of the hill where they could assault into that breach, but the sun the sun reached a certain point in the sky where it was finally above the cloud cover. And the sun shining down cleared away all of the mist. And so it's kind of, it was like a movie scene. Like the mist just parted and it just dissipated. And then all of the uh, the Russian and Austrian commanders looked down into the valley. And suddenly there's just like 15,000 French troops just marching right up through their exposed center. Right into a gap where nobody was defending. And they started to freak the fuck out. I, I can't really blame them. <laughs> because they did not see these guys coming at all and the old, now they're seeing them and they're like 50 yards away like they are they are close enough to shoot you in the face yeah <laughs> and they're just marching right and they just march in and they split the army right in half the russians and the austrians immediately try to turn away from the flanks and try to turn their formations back towards the center but because they're marching in column, they're mar- they're marching in like these long columns. They're having trouble turning because as they're trying to like turn these columns around, all of the guys are just kind of tripping over one another because they're trying to go- do it so fast, and so the lines start falling apart. and And they're not able to get out enough fire to try to push the French out of the center, and so the French are just able to like turn to their left and turn to the right. They just start firing immediately into their ranks on each side and and the the uh the coalition left flank that was attacking the french right flank um they just completely fall apart like they're they were starting to make headway against the french right flank but then even more good shit happens at the exact right time the third corps from vienna appears on the battlefield they charge headlong into the right flank as they're trying to turn back towards the center to take care of take care of this split in their line and they become completely surrounded on like three different sides and so now they just completely fall apart they disintegrate they run they're running for their absolute lives off the field uh they start getting chased down by french cavalry they're chasing them out of the way all of the infantry immediately turns they march up the hill they completely surround the coalition's right flank and they they kill or capture them to a man like half of the half of the entire coalition army is becomes either dead or a prisoner of war in a matter of like half an hour. And the other one and the other half is at that moment being chased across the, uh, across the snow swept fields of, uh, of Bohemia. And the entire force is just completely destroyed. Basically like they can't re- the coalition can't recover these armies. There's no coming back from this. And, and that was like that was it. That was all that Russia had sent, and that was all that Austria had left after the Battle of Ulm. And so now neither Russia nor Austria had any army left. And so, and so, Russia and Austria. By the way, this this battle, the Battle of Austerlitz, 
ends up also being called the Battle of the Three Emperors. Interesting. Because there were three emperors present on the field at the time. There was Napoleon, Emperor of the French. There was Alexander I, the Tsar of Russia. And there was Archduke Francis II, the Holy Roman Emperor. And they were all co- commanding their respective armies, that, which was really where, rare. It's not often you get like two heads of state actually like commanding against one another in a battle. And you had three here. That's, that's a pretty big deal. Um, but yeah, so Russia and Austria just completely annihilated. They signed the Treaty of Pressburg later on in December of 1805. And it, that took them both out of the war. So along with further reinforcing the terms of the Treaty of Campo Formio that had happened at the end of the last episode, it also ceded controls of large parts of Germany to France. And basically it just destroyed Austrian uh, it destroyed Austrian dominion over Germany, which meant that the Holy Roman Empire couldn't exist anymore. And so this is this is it. The, the Holy Roman Empire died. It stopped existing. It couldn't exist anymore. Which is a huge fucking deal because the Holy Roman Empire has been one of the most important, influential political bodies in all of European history for basically like the last 1,000 years. Yeah, that's insane that it finally like gave out. Yeah, like I like I mentioned in the last episode, Napoleon Bonaparte's role in history is to destroy old things and replace them with something new. And that's exactly what he did here. He replaced the Holy Roman Empire with a collection of puppet kingdoms that he united under a cooperative government called the Confederation of the Rhine. And that becomes his sort of puppet government in, uh, in Germany. And the Confederation of the Rhine really scared the shit out of Prussia. Prussia did not like this at all. I imagine not. Uh, Right around this time is when Napoleon is starting to introduce the Napoleonic Codes, which we talked about briefly in our episode on uh, John Moisbach. Yes. As a a catch-up, it basically abolished the sort of like unequal, equal patchwork feudal legal systems that existed in France and a lot of the other puppet governments that they were establishing. And it emphasized like clear promulgation of laws and judicial interpretation. And on top of that, everywhere that Napoleonic France controlled, feudalism was completely abolished. It was completely destroyed. And the entire economy was liberalized, which led to a growth in industrial development in those areas, which also meant a growth in like the, the middle class, the urban middle class or the in in Marx in Marxian economic terms, the uh, uh, the bur- the bourgeoisie or the petty bourgeoisie, and as we all know, the industrialization industrialization of Germany gonna have some pretty profound effects on the country. <laughs> Obviously, um, so like I mentioned, Prussia was not at all happy with these develop with the de- this political development. So a year later, October 1806, to, to try and keep the French from getting too comfortable in Germany, the Prussian king, Friedrich Wilhelm III, uh, he went ahead and he decided, you know, I think I could take this guy. Let's go, let's go try out this Napoleon guy. And he declared war on France. And quickly after that, both Russia and Saxony joined in. So on top of so we got Prussia, Russia, and Saxony. And then, of course, Sweden and Britain are both still at war. And so this launched off the War of the Fourth Coalition. So, yeah, they, they come hot on each other's heels here. We'll go ahead and take that shot real quick. Yeah. Cheers. Prost. Yeah, so we've gotten to the War of the Fourth Coalition. And uh, by this point, Napoleon's kind of settled himself into a good, good, stable strategy for these these wars that he's fighting um whenever a war is declared he moves fast he strikes hard and he tries to knock out one of the major coalitions so he he moved fast he struck hard 
and he tried to knock out one of the major coalition powers before they would have an opportunity to reinforce, which is, oh God, this, I don't, uh, this, this, the story I'm about to tell you, um, is this a trigger warning? No, it's not a trigger warning. It's just, that's usually where you like how you react when it's something pretty sick. Um, it's, it's not like, like disturbing sick. It's like, I can't believe this is real. Like this is the, the dates. Is this another one of those shield moments where it probably got embellished or some shit? It's the thing is, it's just dates. It's just the dates don't make any fucking sense. The timeline doesn't make sense, is what you're saying? Yeah. Um, Prussia declared war on October 9th of 1816. Or 1806, my bad. So, declares war October 9th. On October 14th, the French fought the battles of of Jena and, Au- Jena and Auerstedt. Two battles, they went at the same time on the same day, October 14th destroying the prussian army completely now those dates october 9th declared war october 14th the prussian army is destroyed five days five days five days what the fuck prussia had an army of 190,000 soldiers all 190,000 of them were either killed or taken prisoner in five days what you said 190,000 a hundred and ninety thousand. We're taking pre- how? How is that even logistically possible? How could you round up a hundred and ninety thousand back then in five days? What? I, I think you broke my brain. This I when I was reading about this particular fucking campaign, I was I was convinced like there had to be typos or something, and so I kept. I went to Wikipedia, I checked the dates there, I went to a whole bunch of different, like, articles about it, I checked all the dates there. This all happened in the span of less than a week. And that's, that's so many people. I, I, I don't know, I don't know what to say about that. That, that's just what Napoleon could pull off. That he could do it, and so he did it. It it sounds impossible. It sounds logistically impossible, but everywhere I check says that it's true. Literally logistically impossible. Like I don't think th- I, I, do- I don't think you can get that many people rounded up with those. They're like, I don't even know that you can get that many people rounded up today. So the battles of Jena and Auerstedt were fought on October fourteenth. I think that um, that's when the armies were destroyed. I think they chased down and captured. All of like the running soldiers, like it maybe I think it took like a couple weeks to get to round them all up total, but like the entire command structure of the Prussian army, including the deaths of several of their highest ranking generals, happened in the course of like a five day campaign. That sounds like bullshit. I guess Napoleon, it, he pl- he had a plan for everything. He knew he always knew what to do. I, it doesn't matter if you have a plan for everything. That just is logistically impossible. Well, to be fair, he did have like 400,000 soldiers in his army by this point. So Even then, organization and all that in five days is impossible, right? Yeah, yeah, that's true. Also, after defeating Prussia, he occupied Berlin. Um, he stopped by uh, the crypt, the tomb where uh, Frederick the Great was buried, and... When he entered the crypt, to, when he entered uh, Frederick's tomb to pay his respects, he ordered all of his uh, his commanders that were there with him remove your hats, men. This is this is the tomb of of King Frederick. If he were still alive today, we wouldn't be here right now. He he's saying Frederick would kick his ass. Yeah, he's saying if Frederick were still alive, he'd be the only guy in in this situation who could possibly have beat beat Napoleon. Wow. Which just goes to show how, how, frankly, how cool Frederick the Great was. I think he was pretty cool. <laughs> um, so, after subduing Prussia, he turned towards uh, Russia next. And after months of campaigning against Russia, mostly they were mostly fighting in like Poland, which at the time was kind of split between like like part of it was in part of it was controlled by Prussia, part of it, 
part of it was controlled by Russia, part of it was controlled by Austria, and they were just kind of uh, bouncing all over like occupied Poland, fighting a few like smaller battles until the French finally dealt out the Russians a like a major defeat at the Battle of Friedland on June 14th, 1807. Once again, wiping out most of the Russian army. Napoleon has a bad habit of doing that, just wiping out armies whenever he fights them. Jesus Christ. Later in June, uh, France and Russia, France, Russia, and Prussia uh, signed the Treaty of Tilsit, which ended this, ended this war. And uh, it established the border between France and Russia spheres of influence at the Vistula River, which, if I remember correctly, is like in eastern Poland. Okay. And it also and Russia also had to pull their troops out of uh, Moldavia, the regions of Moldavia and Wallachia, because France had just reallied themselves with the Ottoman Empire. Apparently, apparently the Ottomans had forgiven that whole Napoleon invading Egypt thing, and they wanted to be allies with France again. So, um, so Russia was pulling troops. You can't see me, but I'm doing mean blinky face right now yeah so so napoleon when he invaded egypt in the last episode he would pissed off the ottomans pretty bad because the ottomans had been allies no shit yeah because the ottomans had been allies with revolutionary france before then and so they were at war while napoleon was in egypt and then he went back and, and now the ottoman empire is realizing oh we france is actually able to beat both Austria and Russia, which is something that we've been trying to do for centuries and haven't really been able to. So we're so the Ottomans decided we're going to go ahead and hitch our wagon back to France again because I think we can get a good deal out of being their allies. And so... If, if I didn't want to just hurt myself right now, I would definitely be desk face to desk right now. Yeah, geopolitics is fucking stupid. Yep. So yeah, we get this, uh, this Treaty of Tilsit um... France and Russia, they, they're split. Their spheres of influence are split at the Vishla River. Russia pulls their troops out of Moldavia and Wallachia to relieve pressure off of the Ottoman Empire. And they also concede parts of like Western Poland to France. So they give up some of their territory that they own in Poland. And so out of that, uh, Napoleon creates the, uh, the Duchy of Warsaw. Which is like the the only independent Polish or kind of independent Polish state that will exist until world the end of World War One, basically. So like a hundred hundred years later. Jesus Christ. Yeah, like once once Napoleon is gone, it's gonna get it it's gobbled back up by Russia and uh it Poland won't exist as its own state again until nineteen nineteen. Um, yeah, so then for that, for that reason, Napoleon is, uh, very well beloved in Poland today. He's, he's considered sort of like a, a foreign national hero in Poland, if that makes sense. Like, um, I, if I remember correctly, Poland is the only country on the planet whose national anthem mentions a, a national leader from a nation that isn't their own. And they mentioned Napoleon in their national anthem. Interesting. And uh, so during the discussions of the Treaty of Tilsit, it turns around. It turns out that Napoleon and Tsar Alexander the First actually got along really well. Like they really liked spending time with each other and talking to each other. They they actually got to be like pretty good friends. Um, it's kind of speculated like how one sided this might have actually been if. Because we know for a fact Alexander really liked Napoleon. It's kind of speculated how much Napoleon actually liked Alexander back or if it was just kind of playing him. But they did, like, have a friendly relationship and they did end up, like, corresponding a lot and having, like, a sort of friendship going. And, but the the thing with, the thing with that was that Napoleon had already identified, like, Russia, because Alexander really liked Napoleon, Napoleon figured that, he might be able to get Russia to become an ally with France just by convincing the Tsar. So it's possible he might have just been playing Alexander. It's possible that he might have really liked, actually really liked Alexander. We're not really sure. 
Uh, but whatever the case, Russia ended up getting off pretty easy in this peace deal. Like, very, very minor land concessions. And other than that, like, they didn't really lose much. Prussia, on the other hand, really got... So, yeah. So whatever the case, Russia ended up getting off pretty easy in this peace deal. Prussia, the Kingdom of Prussia, on the other hand, they got shafted hard by Napoleon. Like, it was really bad for Prussia in the Treaty of Tilsit. Yikes. Prussia, they, Prussia ended up losing about half of all of its territory in the deal. It And the territory that they lost was all within Germany, within what used to be the Holy Roman Empire, including uh, their territory in western Western Germany, which ended up becoming, uh, getting reformed by Napoleon into the Kingdom of Westphalia, and uh, and when they when he formed the Kingdom of Westphalia, he actually put his brother uh, Jerome in place as the King of Kingdom of Westphalia. Westphalia. Nepotism at its finest. Yeah, yeah, and I haven't really mentioned it so far, but like all of Napoleon's brothers, he has, I think. Four or three brothers, they have all played very intimate central roles in Napoleon's government so far. They have been really high ranking officers, high ranking politicians. They've been helping Napoleon this entire time. Um, also, uh, coincidentally, this the area of the Kingdom of Westphalia, this is the exact area where my ancestors were from. Wow. So, like that. Like if you look at a map of that of that time period, what year was this? Eighteen oh seven. If you look at a map of eighteen oh seven, you look at the Kingdom of Westphalia. The far southern end of Westphalia, there's a small town called Holtzminden, like at the very southern point of it. And Holtzminden is where my family is from. And uh, I think my my first ancestor. I don't think he was alive. I don't think he could be alive until after Napoleon is gone. But um, his father would have been around to witness all of this happening, and he would have been—he would have come under the kingdom of Westphalia. Okay. Um, my, I wish I knew my friend Mutri that well. On top of all this, the Treaty of Tilsit is also where Napoleon introduced something that came to be called the Continental System. I've never heard of that before. Do go on. Yeah, this is this is actually one of the few things I actually learned about Napoleon, like in public school. Your education was much better than mine, but we've already proved that time and time again. Yeah, that's fair. I I so I'm becoming more convinced that like uh, I th- I don't think that it's a matter of like education not teaching certain things. I think it's a matter of like there's a lot of stuff that people think they weren't taught, but they just weren't paying attention in class. But <laughs> I can tell you, we barely covered Napoleon Bonaparte, in my, like any of that history. Like outside of the U.S., we covered almost nothing. Yeah, we. Uh, the reason that we learned about the Continental System was because it was important in understanding uh, what ended up becoming the uh, the pseudo war, um, the the sort of like like naval conflict between. Uh, France and the United States in around this period of time. Uh, let's see. Oh yeah, continental system. So because Fran- France's chance of invading the British heartland and removing Britain from the board of players in this, these conflicts had pretty much permanently gone up in a ball of fire at Trafalgar. Um, he Napoleon had come up with this with another plan to fight Britain. So he created what's called the Continental System, which was essentially his effort to make... He, he basically had the idea of just conquering all of Europe and then forcing all of Europe to boycott trade with Britain so that he would cut off Britain economically from all of Europe. And so that would end up economically starving Britain out and, force, and forcing them to concede to France. Uh, and as a condition for, so they they would submit themselves to Napoleon in order to open uh, open trade back up if they got uh, if if they got uh, 
look, you know, blood dry enough. And bringing Prussia, Prussia and Russia was an important first step in that because they were two moderately prominent uh, trading partners with Britain. And so now let, let's step back, take a look at where we are real quick. Uh, both Prussia and Austria have been devastated and are in no position to fight back. And in fact, Russia was now starting to kind of get friendly with France. And actually, Russia would end up formally uh, allying with France later on in 1808 at, uh, at the Congress of Erfurt. And they would, pr in, later on in 1808, they would promise aid to France in the event of any future war with Austria. So, yeah, Austria's out, Russia's friendly, Britain... Even though they couldn't be invaded, they didn't really have any way of invading mainland Europe themselves either. But their navy was still kind of a thorn in France's side, but that was something that Napoleon could deal with. And so Napoleon, he went and he settled down in Paris and he got to work on, you know, how to expand the continental system. <laughs> how, to, how to really start to make it hurt on Britain. He decided that his first target was going to be Britain's longtime ally, Portugal. Um, uh, Portugal, the Kingdom of Portugal, was by this time the oldest colonial empire in Europe. It had become influential off of their extensive maritime trade industry, which is basically all that all that uh, Portugal could really do because they were really small. They were really out of the way. Nobody really gave a shit about them, but they got rich off of trading because they had lots of access to water and they had really good ships. So that's so how they made money. And they were really close with Britain. And so they were pretty good trade partners with them. And so Napoleon decided that he was going to go ahead and knock the shit out of Portugal so that they could, he could bring them under French dominion that would cut off trade with Britain, which is a pretty important part of Britain's trade, and uh, start to get this whole continental thing really rolling. So, once again, Spain is at this point allied with France, and King Charles IV of Spain agreed to help transport French troops all the way through Spain. And then in October of 1807, uh, France invaded Portugal over the Pyrenees Mountains. And they started a, uh, they started fighting against uh, uh, Portugal. That started to become a thing. Um, but Napoleon, as he's traveling through Spain, he's he's kind of annoyed with this whole like having to rely on somebody else sort of thing. And he starts kind of looking at maps and he's looking at like where Spain is situated. They're right on the southern border with France, and. Uh, he doesn't like having to rely on somebody else to cover his country's southern flank. And so he starts to hatch this idea. This, this. What harebrained scheme does he come up with? So what he does is he, he sends out his agents. Some Basically, like he directs his diplomats to Spain to start to kind of fuck with the Spanish court. As one does. He, start, he starts meddling in Spanish politics. Starts uh, His diplomats start turning members of the court against one another and into like different factions that start to develop. And this is happening over the course of a few months in the winter of 1807 and 1808. Until in early 1808, there's now like open infighting within the court in Spain. Damn. And it's... It, it's worked so effectively that it's kind of bringing pol the political like operations of the state to a standstill in Spain. And it's because of that, it's kind of becoming hard to be a good ally to France. And so now with the Spanish state weekend, Napoleon used this as an opportunity, this all of this factionalism that he himself had made as an excuse to go and invade and occupy Spain. And so that's exactly what he does. He sends his, in his army in March of 1808. And there's there's no there's not really like much of a fight. They just kind of move in and they occupy the country. 
They occupy the city of Madrid. It's garrisoned with French troops and the the and Charles the Fourth, the King of Spain. He's ousted, and in his place, Napoleon puts his brother Joseph Bonaparte as the King of Spain. More nepotism. We love it. More nepotism. Yes. So, in response to this, almost immediately, riots break out all across the country. Uh, guerrilla armies start forming in the countryside, and because they, uh, because there are, uh, because Portugal had already been allied to Britain, there are already British troops in Portugal, and so the British troops that are in Portugal, they just kind of move into Spain, and they start helping out a lot of these, uh, a lot of these guerrillas, start training them, start arming them, and these guerrillas go out and they start harassing French supply lines and assaulting garrisons and things like that. It starts to make it kind of a nightmare for the French army in Spain. This this whole this whole kerfuffle is now called the Peninsular War, and we have actually talked about the Peninsular War. This is this is the episode where everything starts to, all all of the different topics that we've already done so far in our in the podcast. I kind of figured, like, it seemed like we've, we, a lot of the stuff we've talked about before kind of, like, coalesce here. Yeah, it's all coming together. Um, the Peninsular War we talked about in our episode on Simon Bolivar. Because the overthrow of Charles IV was what prompted the Spanish-American colonies to form juntas, which eventually became the Revolutionary Republics. That was the... The overthrow of Charles IV was the start of the uh, the Spanish American, uh, the Latin American revolutions. Okay, and so I figured I'd mention that, bring it up, another little intersection. So Napoleon came to he came down personally to Spain in order to start to address this whole guerrilla war thing. His main priority was just getting the British out of Spain. He wanted to get, go ahead and get those guys out real quick. And he successfully did that. He forced the British out of Spain for a while at the Battle of Coruna in January of 1809. Later on, in April of 1809, Austria decided that they wanted to give that whole, you know, war with Napoleon thing another go so that they could try and call, claw back some influence in Germany. And so Napoleon ended up being forced to leave Spain behind. But but after he left, the war in Spain kept going. Oh, did it now? Um, the British would eventually return, and the guerrillas would never give up their harassment of French troops. Dang. In, in fact, this, this war came to be called the Spanish Ulcer. That was the nickname for it. Because it, it was constantly draining resources and manpower from the rest of Napoleon's wars, all the wars he was fighting, uh, pretty much until the day he stopped his stopped ruling France. Some have called the occupation of Spain one of his greatest mistakes, and some people even see it kind of as the beginning of the end of his reign. Was it like how do you, how do you view it? Um, it definitely was his very first big fuck up. Um, and it would play a, de- a significant role in the reason that he eventually fell from power. Okay. Um, but I don't know. He he hasn't reached the pinnacle of his like his control over Europe yet. He's still going up at this point. So I think it's okay. So it wasn't like the beginning of the end, but it was like a a hiccup along the way. Yeah, it was a hiccup that would eventually grow into something worse that would exacerbate when time started to get hard. Um, so, like I said, Archduke Francis II, the Austrians, they decided to give it uh, one more good college try. And they sent an army into French-controlled Bavaria on April 10th, 1809, which launched off the War of the Fifth Coalition. So that's going to be another shot for us. There we go. I was trying to figure out where I set my shot down <laughs> for a second. I moved it off to the side. Cheers. Prost. So yeah, we're getting into the War of the Fifth Coalition. Napoleon showed back up and uh, immediately so so the war launches off in April on April 10th, 1809. Uh, Austrians and Napoleon have uh, the Battle of Ekmühl 
that's a weird sounding name, but I'm assuming it's a language difference. It's, yeah, it's German. It's Ekmul. The Battle of Ekmul on April 22nd, 1809. That is 12 days later. And they don't quite destroy the Austrian army. They come close, but the Austrians manage to make it out. Retreat. Uh, retreat the army out to Bohemia. And then after that, Vienna is just completely open. And so the French troops move in and they occupy Vienna again for the second time in four years. The French tried... So Napoleon, he takes his army, he tries to follow the Austrian army into Bohemia, but they ended up getting... He ended up getting held up at at the Danube River at the Battle of Aspern Essling. This battle turned out to be Napoleon's first actual real defeat on the battlefield. It's the first time that he's ever been beaten in actual battle. Damn. And it, it's not a de- decisive defeat. Like, his, his army isn't destroyed or even, like, badly mauled or anything. He just gets pushed back from being able to cross the river. Um, it did, however, like, kind of begin to show the cracks in, like, this aura of invincibility that he kind of has because at this point everybody in Europe is convinced that uh, he can't actually be beat and that this is kind of the first step in like the process of kind of breaking that aura around him Um, so he loses this battle he pulls back and he spends about six weeks preparing plans for a second attempt and after six weeks weeks he launches another crossing attempt in late june and early july and he finally met the austrians and beat them decisively at the battle of wagram on july 6 hell yeah finally forcing the austrians to once again concede defeat so that's a it's a bad thing that happened to austria let's go ahead and do our three sips three sips so austrians once again concede defeat we have the Treaty of Schönbrunn, and this treaty was the harshest treaty yet on Austria. The new Austrian uh, prime minister, this guy named uh, Metternich, he successfully negotiates with Napoleon's government to allow Austria and the Habsburgs to keep all of their crown lands, so like, basically just like the main part of Austria proper. And they agreed to ally with France. And in exchange, they they gave up most of their territory. Or at least most of their territory like outside of Austria proper. Okay. So all of their territory in the Balkans. Well, all of their territory in Eastern Europe, including um, all the parts of Poland that they owned. In the process, they lose about a fifth of their population. Which is about three million people. I was about to ask how big mil- uh, a fifth was, but holy fuck! Yeah, so this is a pretty big deal for Austria. They're kind of fucked up by this. <laughs> so now to uh, to dip into uh, Napoleon's personal life for a moment, and not not for any particular reason, just be well for a particular reason, not for. Not for drama or anything, but just because it's actually relevant and important to the political stuff that's going on. Um, Napoleon's marriage to Empress Josephine, his his wife, uh, it's kind of on thin ice right now. Uh, they're not doing great marriage-wise. So he had found out about some of the affairs that she had been having. Because, you know... She's literally cucking him. Yeah, the most famous woman in Paris for a reason. Um, and besides that, he never really got along with her. Like, they didn't have a lot in common. She didn't really like spending time with him. I don't know why she married him. Money? Prestige? Yeah, she was kind of... She, you know, the the kind of circles that she she rolled in in, like, French, like Paris high society, she got good at kind of, like finding a mark like find uh, identifying people who were gonna go far kind of hitching her wagon to them that that's kind of why she she had the affairs that she did 
it was only ever with powerful men that she thought that would be getting more powerful. And she really hit the mark on Napoleon. It's just that she hitched her wagon a little too securely by getting married to him. Duh. But the thing, the crazy thing is, Napoleon is still, like, desperately in love with her. And would be desperately in love with her until the day that he died. Damn, he sounds like a dumbass like me. So, yeah, uh, so Napoleon, uh, Napoleon and Josephine's marriage, not going great. He found out about some affairs. They'd never really gotten along anyways. Uh, but the most pressing thing on his mind was the fact that, um... Josephine hadn't gotten pregnant yet, and he kind of needed her to get pregnant because that's the only way he's... How did she not get pregnant if she was... I have no idea. She was fucking everything that moved. I... I, The only guess I have to have is either the the very dangerous abortions of the time, because abortions were dangerous until, like, honestly, very recently in history. If we ever do the H.H. Holmes episode, you're going to see how... Fucked abortions were back in the day, Derek. Yeah, yeah, I can believe it. I'm... No, like, a big part of that episode, the reason why he got victims, will be because of abortions. So, yeah, it, it's just really weird. She, like, she, there's no evidence that she ever had, like, an abortion or anything. Uh, it's just that she... I don't think so. I said that more as a joke. Because how violent abortions were at the time, um, you weren't likely to survive them. Yeah. Yeah, it, it wasn't a great thing back then. I, I can only imagine, like, I don't know the specifics, but, like, I can only imagine because of the way the medicine worked back then. Yeah, she just, so she just hadn't gotten pregnant, and that was a big deal because, you know, the emperor needs an heir. No shit. So it was, it was a political reason, but it was also kind of an ego thing. Like, he was kind of offended that he didn't have a kid yet. Um, which, you know, maybe the fact that he spent the majority of their marriage out on campaign fighting wars might have something to do with it. But what do I know? To seal the deal on the Treaty of Schönbrunn and to secure an alliance between France and Austria, what he did was he actually divorced Josephine. Oh, damn. He got their, he got their marriage annulled, and instead he married the daughter of francis the second damn the archduke of austria uh a woman her name was archduchess marie louise marie louise habsburg who was 18 at the time and they were married they married on march 11th 1810 and because i know i already know you're going to ask she was 18 he was 41 disgusting he should be hung yeah that's yeah, that's, that's pretty fucked up. Um, on March 20th, 1811. Yeah, yeah, on March 20th, 1811. So a little over a year after they got married, Marie Louise gave birth to little little Napoleon Jr. And he and this new son became Napoleon's heir. And also because Napoleon was now projecting his himself and his own ambitions onto his son uh he just created an entire new kingdom in italy uh it was it had been it was it had been part of his own uh his own realm in italy the kingdom of italy he just broke part of it off and made it the kingdom of rome so that he could give his own newborn son a crown and he crowned his newborn son the king of Rome, Napoleon the First, king of Rome. Really, it's presumptuous there. Also, by the way, uh, that band that I told you about, that the, my tattoo, that band, um, yeah, Adjudicator, um, their very first album is called King of Rome because it's about Napoleon. Damn. So yeah, a little break from war, he's got a new family, he's spending his time passing some reforms. Not just in France, but all throughout his European realm, all of these different countries that he now controls. And he's trying to cement, he's spending his time trying to cement the continental system um, into place, along with spending, you know, spending time with his new family, like I mentioned. Uh, Russia, Russia and Austria were now his friends, at least on paper. 
Uh, Prussia still hated him, but they were so beat to shit that they couldn't really do anything. Uh, Sweden was now on the back foot due to Russia's conquest of Finland. And I, I'm pretty sure, like, I didn't write it down, but pretty soon after this, um, the Swedish government is actually going to capitulate to Russia and France. And their government is is going to be replaced by um, a French puppet. And that French puppet is going to be one of uh, Napoleon's generals, um, a guy named Bernadotte. And Bernadotte's wife is uh, Desiree Clary, who was Napoleon's um, Napoleon's uh, uh, fiance before he before he dumped her and married Josephine. Yeah, so you remember in the last episode we talked about Desiree Clary, um, who was Napoleon's first fiance before he married Josephine. And you remember you remember how I mentioned that she became the uh, the she would end up becoming the queen of Sweden. Yeah. Yeah, so that's hap- that's how that happened was that um Sweden ended up getting dragged into a war with Britain against France. Um Russia allied with France and then Russia defeated France in a war, ended up conquering Finland, which is controlled by Sweden. And then after that, the Swedish government kind of just fell apart, and so Napoleon moved in um and established his own new kingdom in in Sweden and installed one of his best generals as the king of Sweden. This guy named his last his last name was Bernadotte. I can't remember his first name off the top of my head. But Bernadotte ended up getting married to Desiree Clary bef- uh, after Napoleon broke off their engagement. And so that's how Desiree Clary became the queen of Sweden. And uh, fun fact, the house of Bernadotte is still the royal family in Sweden to this day. Yeah, there's still a bunch of French <laughs> French assholes <laughs> ruling over Sweden for some reason. <laughs> also, Sweden still has a royal family. They still have a monarchy. Who I didn't fucking know that until like a couple years ago. <laughs> Damn, I, I I didn't know that period. Yeah, they just they they just kind of did they did the same thing Britain did. They just kind of evolved into the modern world without ever bothering to get rid of their monarchy it's uh, it's it's some shit it's it's fucking stupid spain did the same thing though their monarchy's uh history is in the 20th century is a lot more fucking convoluted but uh spain still has a royal family i think the either the netherlands or belgium still has a royal family and sweden still has a royal family Okay, yeah, so where are we? Uh, yeah, so Russia and Austria were now friends with France, at least on paper. Prussia was so beat to shit that they couldn't really do anything. Uh, Sweden was on the back foot due to Russia's conquest of Finland and would soon have their monarchy overthrown and replaced with one of Napoleon's generals who was married to Napoleon's former fiance, which is how she became the Queen of Sweden. Um... And Britain, even though they were still at war with France, really didn't have a chance in hell of ever getting an army onto the continent. Um, Spain, even though technically it was occupied by French forces, they still had that whole guerrilla war going on, which is a real pain in the ass. But all things considered, by the start of 1812, Napoleon had kind of a mass for him. This is the height of Napoleon's power. He had amassed for himself probably one of the greatest empires that Europe had ever seen. He controlled everything from from Portugal to Poland, from Sweden to southern Italy, and everywhere in between. Basically all of what what we think of when we hear the phrase Europe. He controlled it. Damn. He had an army that was... At this point, 450,000 strong. And that didn't even include all of the puppet governments, the armies of the puppet governments that he controlled. They all had their own armies too, and they could reinforce the French army that he controlled. So he's 
easily the most powerful man in all of Europe. But uh, there is kind of, there's something wrong. Something that kind of threatened all of this. And the, the, the problem that was coming up was that things were becoming tense with his friend, this, this new friend that he had made, Tsar Alexander, over in Russia. And the problem was coming up because with all of this war, you know, war and the and losing a war and losing territory as a result of losing a war, it turns out that's actually kind of bad for an economy of a country. Who would have ever guessed? Yeah. Yeah, it's kind of kind of wild that losing territory can kind of affect your economy in negative ways. Um, and as it turns out, cutting off trade with Britain, Britain being one of the most prolific trade partners on the entire planet at the time. No shit. Considering all the shit they did for spices, but never using. <laughs> right, yeah. It, it turns out that uh, cutting off trade with Britain actually was kind of bad for countries. Um, it wasn't just bad for Britain, it was also bad for all the countries that were doing the boycotting as well. Because they were getting less shit too. And so as a result, Russia's economy was kind of in the toilet. Like we're wanting it to be right now. Yeah. <laughs> um, so to try and keep the Russian economy from being like a complete shit show, you know, to kind of at least stabilize it a little bit, Alexander had kind of been, you know, doing some light stabbing his friend Napoleon in the back and uh, had kind of been violating the continental system in order to do some very limited trading with Britain against the Pol- against Napoleon's orders. This end up being good or bad? And Alex. Did this end up being a good thing or a bad thing? Um, It was a bad thing for everybody involved just because of the way that Napoleon reacted to it. Yeah. Um, So, Tsar Alexander, he didn't want to start shit with France, but he really needed that trade. And also, frankly, even though he liked Napoleon, he was still kind of peeved about losing Poland. And so... He kept, so Russia just kept ignoring Napoleon, trying to get him to stick on with the continental system. And uh, Alexander's advisors convinced him that he would have to start gearing up for a potential war with France. And even with the possibility that maybe they'd have to be the ones to start the war and invade into French-controlled territory themselves. Uh, but Napoleon was ahead of the curve. He sensed where the winds were shifting, and so he decided that he was going to act first. Okay. And so he rallied the Grand Armée in Poland at the border with Russia on June 24th, 1812. He declared war on Russia, and then he marched his army into the Russian Empire. How did that work out for him? Yeah, how do you want to think an invasion of Russia turned out? <laughs> Piss fucking poor. Piss fucking poor. Now here's where we get to the Russian invasion problem. And I want to I want to make something clear right now. This isn't the Russian winter is going to come up. The problem is not the Russian winter. The the problems don't start with the Russian winter. That's not the main thing. Like It's the same thing with, like, Hitler and with the Nazi invasion of Russia. The problem, the main problem was not with the winter. It was other factors that the winter then exacerbated. I wanted to get that out of the way real quick. If I hear one more thing about Russian winter being the cause of anything, I'm going to throw a fit. Derek, that's a low bar for you. Yeah, I know it is, but I'm still going to do it because I know it annoys people. (laughs) <laughs> so the the problem isn't russian winter the problem is the size of russia russia is fucking huge it's enormous 
And when you're fighting on Russian turf, the Russian army doesn't actually have to fight you to win. All they have to do is to get you to keep chasing them. And while they're chasing you, you burn down everything that's in their path. So you're, so what ends up happening is that your, your army won't have anything to scavenge from the countryside because it's all gone up in smoke. And the further that you get from your own supply lines, the harder it is to get you supplies, which then can't be supplemented with going out and scavenging because everything's burned. And so the further you get into Russia, the more people starve. And that's how Russians have always defended themselves whenever they're invaded. Sounds like the best way to do it. Yeah, because it's worked every single time it's been done. And so... That's exactly what the Russians were doing here. They did decide, like, Alexander did decide to go ahead and engage the French at the Battle of Borodino on September 7th, just as an attempt, not not any attempt at actually winning, but just, you know, slowing them down a little bit, letting them kind of start to starve themselves out a little bit more. Um, and Napoleon wanted a battle because he... He thought that if he could wipe out the Russian army in like one fell swoop, just in one battle, uh, he could end the war really quickly. And the Russians were having none of it. That didn't work out so well for him, did it? 35,000 French troops were killed in one day. God damn. Which, granted, it was out of 400,000. So it doesn't, it, in the broad scope of things. That's still a huge number. Yeah, it's still a huge number. And he lost 35,000 troops, and the Russians were still able to uh, retreat with their army relatively intact. And so the, the Battle of Borodino was, far and away, without exception, the single bloodiest battle in Napoleon's entire life. Because not only did, not only did the French lose 35,000, the Russians lost 44,000. And so it's actually possible that September 7th, 1812 is actually the single bloodiest day in the entire history of warfare. Seriously? Like in all of human history. Just it, the most people killed in a battle in a single day. And we don't know about this more? No, it, it, I didn't learn about this in school. Um, but yeah, 44,000 plus, that's... The eighty thousand, around eighty thousand people killed in a single day. Um, the Battle of Cannae was, I think, forty five thousand. That was in, uh, that was like one hundred and fifty something BC, and then the Battle of, uh, the first day of the Somme offensive during World War One. I think that was about 65,000 British troops were killed in one day. And and that was with the help of machine guns and artillery. Borodino was just guys with muskets and cannons. It, it, this the the Napoleon's invasion of Russia is so so dark. There's so much fucked up shit that's happening right now. I'm not getting into, like, any of the specifics, but, like, everywhere that the French army is going, they're just fucking wiping out villages. Um, just... Uh, this to be expected with war, for one, but, like, this sounds like it's on another level compared to normal. Yeah, and that's just what Napoleon did. That's the Napoleonic era of warfare. Everything that's always existed in warfare is just being knocked up to 11. So, Napoleon and his army, uh, they... They got so far into into Russia that they actually occupied the city of Moscow on September 14th. They didn't have to fight for it. Because by the time that they arrived, the city was completely abandoned. There was not a single soul alive in Moscow when the French army marched in and occupied it. It had been a, you know, a mid Compared to like Western Europe, like a mid-sized city, it had a, you know, a, probably around 
a hundred thousand, maybe, maybe a hundred and fifty thousand residents. It's not. Re- it's not entirely like clear how many residents, but however many they had, they had fucking cleared out. They were gone. They had evacuated long before the French got there. It wasn't a. So I said there wasn't a single soul. That's not completely correct. There were a few Russians left there. And they were left there on purpose. Because the night after the French arrived in the city, these these people that were left behind, they were agents of the governor of the city of Moscow, appointed by Alexander. And they had orders that once the French arrived and settled down into the city, these agents would go around to different parts of the city and all at the same time set all of the buildings on fire. And so while the French were in the city, the entire city burned to the ground over the course of a couple of days. The, in, the entire city of Moscow was leveled. An enti- the entire, entire city of Moscow. Yes, the entire city of Moscow. Holy fuck. And uh, this was, uh, you know, this seems bad for the Russians, you know, losing, like, their second most important city. Um, at, because at the time, Moscow wasn't the capital. The mount, the capital was up north in uh, Petrograd. Or, uh, I guess it wasn't called Petrograd yet. It was St. Petersburg. Um, but this was still, like, their second most important city. And it was, it now no longer existed, basically. (laughs) And uh, this was bad for the French, too, because now they no longer had buildings to sleep in. I don't know if you noticed the date, September 14th. uh, Winter's getting close. It's it's starting to get close to fall, and the temperature's starting to fall. They kind of really shot themselves in the foot. Yeah. And so Napoleon's kind of uh, frazzled. He's never fought a war like this. He's never experienced war like this before. And so he's kind of, he sits, he ends up sitting, he and his army in Moscow for about five weeks because he's just trying to figure out what the fuck to do. He's kind of figured at this point, well, we'll just stay in Moscow. We'll make do with what we have and we'll winter here. And if the Russians try to attack us here, we can fight them off. If if not, then we'll just wait it out here in Moscow until spring comes around, and then we can go back on the offensive and finish off what's left of the Russian army. That's that's kind of his thinking. Um, five weeks into it, he received a message from Paris that uh, there had been an attempted coup in, in the capital against his government. And it had been conducted... This coup had been attempted by a former Republican general, this guy named Claude Francois de Malay, who had been he had been a, a general in the Republican army, and then once Napoleon crowned himself emperor, he resigned his commission in disgust, and then kind of hung out as like a middle manager in the civil service for a decade until this point where he decided to get in contact with a few of the exiled members of the Bourbon family and teamed up with them in order to try and launch a uh, launch a coup that would overthrow Napoleon and reinstate the Republic. I'm assuming that didn't go so well. It did not. He was uh, he was captured and he was put up against the wall and shot. But Napoleon didn't know that yet. He only knew that there was a coup attempt. And so now he suddenly felt very, very vulnerable, stranded in the middle of of Russia with winter approaching, while his government might soon be overthrown, as far as he knew. Pressure's definitely on. Yeah. And so, for the first time in Napoleon's entire life, he just decided to admit defeat. Holy shit. Even good men know when to admit defeat. Sometimes. And your definition of good man. So he, yeah, he's admitting defeat and he's ordering his army to rally, form into column, and they start marching home. 
But there's a couple problems, if you couldn't guess. I I assumed something would fuck up. Yeah. For one, like I mentioned before, he entered Russia in June. He's leaving in October. For most of the march back to Poland, the French troops are walking through knee-high snow. And most days that they're marching, and also most nights for that matter, they're being blasted with snowstorms. So what you're saying is winter starts really fucking early in Russia. Winter, yeah, winter, it, it just is rush, It is winter in Russia. In the summer, it's just a... It, Summer is mild winter. Winter is harsh winter. That's how Russia is. Um, Paired with that, whatever supply lines they had left that could reach them could no longer reach them, both because of the weather and, of course, because of the distance. Those two combined together, they were not getting shit. Sounds about right. That compounded with the fact that all of this land that they had passed through had already been burned by the retreating Russians. In one night on November 8th, in just a single night, 10,000 troops froze to death. In a single night, 10,000 people died. And this was hap- in a in a single night, yes. And every single day and every single night, Napoleon is losing more and more troops from this army. They, as they, as they march, men will simply just fall onto the ground, and and the men behind him will just step over his body and continue marching. the The roads in Russia are just littered with tens of thousands of dead French bodies. They are all over the place. When in the following. Uh, the following spring, when the snow started to thaw, the local peasants who had retreated again before the French advance, they'd come back to their towns. And then um, the following spring, when the snow thawed, there was this outbreak and this epidemic of these viral diseases and these bacterial diseases all throughout the Russian countryside because all of the French bodies were being exposed and were, and were thawed out and they started to rot. And there's just piles of piles of French bodies just lining the roads. And it just every day for like a month and a half, just tens of thousands of these guys dying from cold, dying from starvation, dying from dehydration. Um, One of the main causes of death was actually the fact that the few rush rations that they did have didn't have enough salt. And so a lot of them, a lot of the French troops actually weren't not get, weren't getting enough sodium. Yeah, they died of sodium uh, deficiencies. Jesus. And then on top of that, the entire march back through Russia out, they were also being harassed by Russian troops, who would just pop out of the snow, uh, fire off a few shots into their ranks, and then run away. They're just being harassed like guerrilla fighters. Like the same shit that like the Minutemen did in the American Revolution against British troops. And then on top of that, even worse, um, a bunch of these guys, a bunch of these French troops ended up getting massacred by French, by Russian peasants. Russian peasants would just come out of their farms, come out of hiding, and they'd go and they'd find like an isolated sort of group of French soldiers. They'd surround them and then they'd just tear them to pieces with their farming equipment. Wow, holy fuck, that's brutal. This was an awful time. This was a horrible time for Napoleon and his army. And I'm about to tell you that... Sounds like Napoleon went on like a huge losing streak out. I'm about to tell you the numbers, and you are not going to believe me. You are going to call me a liar. You are going to tell me bullshit multiple times when I tell you the numbers. Hit me with your bullshit numbers. Napoleon marched into Russia with an army of 400,000 in the June of eight, in June of 1812. When he and his army returned to Poland in November of 1812, there were 40,000 left. Fuck off. 
that is that is not a joke. That that I'm not lying. That that sounds like bullshit. It's not bullshit. It's considered one of the greatest tragedies of the 19th century. Yeah, of the 19th century. Good God, Napoleon fucked up big time. Napoleon fucked up so bad. This was this probably more than any other factor is what caused his downfall. And this, ladies and gentlemen of the audience, is what we call fuck around and find out. It's called the scientific method. So that is, out of 400,000, 40,000 survived. So that is 360,000 dead. That deserves a sip for all those poor souls. And that's just the French. On the Russian side, they lost 150,000 soldiers and half a million civilians. About five about 500,000 civilians died due to a variety of factors, but mainly like f- atrocities committed by the French army during their advance. Good God. This was a horrific, horrific event that was completely caused by Napoleon's ego and overconfidence. I never said I liked the guy. Oh yeah, I don't like the guy either. I thought I think he's brilliant in his in certain ways. This was this like this shit and the shit that he did in Egypt completely inexcusable. Napoleon ended up he hung out for a while to lick his wounds and to rebuild his army. And luckily for France, or luckily for him and for France, his country had pretty much like it, for the time, like an endless supply of manpower. So he staked out in Germany and he started rebuilding the Grand Ar- the Grand Armée. And in about eight months, he was back up to about 350,000 troops strong. Now, granted, um, they weren't, it wasn't as big as the Grand Armée had been before they invaded Russia. And the troops that they did have were not nearly as well trained because they had to be recruited on such short notice. And they were all, none of them, or almost none of them had ever been seen battle before. God damn, he's sending blabes to slaughter. Yeah, it, yeah, it's, it's a, the average age of his army between, uh, 1812 and 1813 dropped by about 12 to 15 years. Good God! Yeah, you're seeing a lot more like 16, 17, 18 year olds in this army than you did a year prior. Um, and so he was able to get his army back up to like a pretty good strength, but the other powers in Europe suddenly smelled blood in the water because. Napoleon's charm had broken. It was done. It was gone. He was no longer invincible. He, he no longer had that aura of invincibility protecting him. France was, at this point, still at war with Britain, Russia, Spain, and Portugal. And now, all of a sudden, Sweden, Austria, and Prussia decided to come out of hiding and declare war on him again. Keep in mind, Sweden, they're declaring war on him too. Sweden is ruled by one of his generals. His general is turning on him now. (laughs) God damn. And so this is the start of the War of the Sixth Coalition. Yeah, that's another shot, right? Okay, then yes. Yes, it is. Cheers. Okay, Prost. So, at the start of this particular war, Napoleon was actually kind of doing pretty well at first all things considered so he set up shop in germany in eastern germany and as as the uh as the coalition armies came at him from all sides he started dealing out some pretty bad defeats to them he was he was kind of staying on top for the most part uh most notably at the battle of dresden in august of 1813 wiped out a couple of armies um but now there's just too many there are too many people 
There are too many countries involved. There are too many armies involved. They could just keep coming. He became overwhelmed. He was getting come at it. They were coming at him at all sides. He and his army ended up getting pinned down at the city of Leipzig in October of 1813. How badly does it end for him? Uh, it's pretty bad. Um, so he's decisively defeated at the Battle of Leipzig. Um, it, it's pretty pretty awful. It's, it was like three days of fighting. A good chunk of his army got killed, and he tried to withdraw his army in good order um, through Leipzig across the bridge, bridge of the, I think it's the Edsel River, or something like that. Um, they tried to retreat across a bridge in the middle of town across the river. Um, he has his sappers set up on the bridge, hooked up with explosives, ready to blow the bridge whenever the last of the French troops get through. Um, but before all of the French troops can get through, the explosives go off early. And so several hundred French troops end up either getting blown apart or dropped into the river where they drown. And then there's still about 25,000 of his troops still left on the other bank. And they end up getting overwhelmed and chased down, either getting killed by coalition, like Austrian cavalry, or being forced to surrender and they became POWs, including several of his highest ranking generals. Um, and so they end up retreating from Leipzig. They retreat all the way to the Rhine River in West Germany. And so in November of 1813, the coalition offered Napoleon a peace deal to end the war. This peace deal that they offered him would allow him to remain emperor of France, but it would push back his the boundaries of his empire uh, to just include France, Belgium, and Western Germany, the area west of the Rhine River, referred to as the, as the Rhineland. Um, he refused this offer. But of course. Yeah, because he, he figured that if they're offering a, a peace deal without delivering a final blow, it must mean that they're tired and they're running out of money or they're running out of manpower or something. There's a reason they're doing it. And the reason they want it to end so fast. So that means they have a weakness. And if I can push that weakness, then I can pull out a decisive defeat and put them on the back foot. How did that turn out for him? Um, he refused. He lost a few more battles. And then once again, he's offered peace. This time without including Belgium or the Rhineland. So after that, if you want... If you can, if you surrender now, you can stay emperor, but all you own is France. I'm, I'm, I'm sure that one would have been a huge blow to his ego if he accepted it. Yeah, at this point, it's like he'd he'd rather die than rule just France. France is France by itself is too small for him. So he once again refused, and uh, by December of eighteen thirteen. Napoleon's Grand Armée, which he had rebuilt after the invasion of Russia, had, was now once again dwindling to less than 100,000. He was now at about 70,000 troops. With the way the war sounds like it's going, it makes total sense he's running out of troops again. Yeah, not all of them had been killed. A good chunk of them were just wounded and had to go home. They weren't able to serve anymore. A good chunk of them were just deserters like they just left they kind of saw the writing on the wall again i don't blame them yeah yeah that's what happens in losing armies the peak guys start to desert um his brother uh, napoleon's brother joseph bonaparte ab abdicates the spanish throne and he returns to the french army and becomes a lieutenant general uh, and then in January of 1814, coalition forces finally broke through the French defenses and marched into France itself. So you can see, starting with the retreat from France, or the retreat from Russia, it's all just snowballed out of control, and it just he just kept getting pushed back further and further and further until now he's stuck in France, 
and there's coalition armies in France. Uh, Napoleon launched one last, just a last-ditch effort offensive to try and force the coalition out. It was called the Six Days Campaign. It was a complete success, but he, like, he, he won several really big, major victories, outnumbered like two to one, sometimes three to one, several huge battles. And all that accomplished was that it held up the coalition armies for about a month. And finally, on March 29th, a Prussian army arrived at the outskirts of Paris. After a brief battle where Joseph Bonaparte led a French army that was outnumbered five to one. Wait, his name was Joseph Bonaparte? That feels like... His brother, Napoleon's brother. I I, I know, but that just feels like super like basic compared to... Napoleon. Yeah, it's yeah in in I don't, I don't know it's yeah in like because like in France it's like Joseph or something like that. But I I get what you're saying though. It's yeah, it seems like I guess it's just because Joseph is actually like a common or Joseph is actually a common name in English, and I don't think you're ever gonna meet anybody with an actual the actual name Napoleon. I think Napoleon was actually like a moderately common name in in Italy, like in the uh, like in the early modern period, like seventeen sixteen hundreds. Uh, I can't remember for sure though, but yeah, Joseph Joseph does sound kind of like basic compared to Napoleon, doesn't it? So Joseph Bonaparte led a French army that was at number five to one, got the shit kicked out of them. And Paris surrendered on March 30th, 1814. Napoleon and his detachment of the army that he was controlling were at the town of Fontainebleau when he received news that Paris had fallen. In response to the news, several of Napoleon's marshals confronted him and they told him that they were no longer going to lead his troops. And they urged him to abdicate and to end the war. He didn't listen, did he? He tried. He tried to fight them. He tried to convince them to return to their posts and to continue the fight. But they didn't budge. And without his commanders, he couldn't lead the armies on it. And so he finally realized that it was, yeah, he's, he's fucked. It's over. It's done. He had a good run, but this is it. End of the line. So on April, April 4th, he tried to abdicate in favor of his son with his wife as regent of France while his son was still, an, while his son was still a minor. Was he going to try and like control the country through his wife or something? I'm sure he had an idea like that in mind, but I think his main thing was just making sure that a Bonaparte still ruled. Fair. Like, I, I get the idea of trying to preserve your lineage, even if I think it's kind of stupid. I don't mean in, like, preserving the family line, but, like, preserving the family power or some bullshit like that. And so, so he tried to offer to abdicate in favor of his son, but the Allies refused to have a Napoleon or a, to have a, a Bonaparte sit on the throne of France, and they told him that they would not accept anything but an unconditional surrender. And so that's exactly what he did. On April eleventh, eighteen fourteen, Emperor Napoleon the First of the House of Bonaparte abdicated his throne and surrendered himself to the coalition. His formal act of abdication reads, quote, The Allied powers have declared that Emperor Napoleon was the sole obstacle to the restoration of peace in Europe. Emperor Napoleon, faithful to his oath, declares that he renounces for himself and his heirs the thrones of France and Italy, and that there is no personal sacrifice, even that of his life, 
which he is not ready to make in the interests of France. Done in the Palace of Fontainebleau, 11 April 1814. The war ends with the Treaty of Fontainebleau and the Allies exile Napoleon from France and send him to the island of Elba, which is just off the coast of Italy on the west side. It is an island with 12,000 inhabitants. Napoleon was allowed to keep his title of emperor, and he was also given sovereignty over the island. And so he became, in exile, the king of Elba. So he was allowed to rule it as king, but he wasn't allowed to leave the island. That was the condition. So it was a, it was a, the title only. He wasn't actually able to exert any power. He was able to exert power over Elba, the island itself. He did actually control Elba, which, as it turns out, because the, the coalition figured that, like, well, it's, it's an island. It's an island of twelve thousand people. What what's he gonna do with that? He can't do anything with it. But yes, he he did have he did have actual power over this island. Not anything else. He was still allowed to be called emperor. That was still his title. But he just ruled this one island. He was he wasn't allowed to leave the island. He sure as shit was never allowed to set foot in France ever again. That was a huge no no number one. Shortly after he arrived at Elba, there was this, he had this, uh, this poison pill, the, like this arsenic pill, that he, that he had started, he first got his hands on it when he first invaded Russia. He, he got it because he was afraid that there was a good chance he might end up getting captured in battle in Russia, because Russia's fucking big, there's not a lot of places to, re- to retreat to, so there was a good chance that if he lost a battle, he might end up getting captured and so he figured if he ca- if he was captured he'd just take this arsenic pill and commit suicide um which is if you if you recall in our frederick the great episode during the seven years war frederick did the same thing um and so i i have no doubt that he might have been thinking about frederick as he carried this pill around with him um after he arrived in elba he tried to take the pill, and he tried to kill himself. But the pill was so old by that point that the poison had lost its potency. I guess that answers the question whether it becomes more or less po- uh, lethal. It became less lethal. It just made him sick and gave him a bad stomach ache for a few days. Yeah, so back in France, the coalition, the allies restored the Bourbon dynasty to power. So during the revolution, Louis the Sixteenth had been killed. His son, Louis the, his son was supposed to become Louis the Seventeenth, uh, but he was still a minor. And in seventeen ninety five, when, when the younger Louis, the child Louis, was still in custody, by the Republican government. He got sick and died. Oof, that's a that's a hell of a group. Yeah, he was ten at the time. It really sucks. The he, here's the crazy thing: he died when the Directory was in power, but when the uh, when the Montagnards were in power, like when Robespierre was in power, he had actually been the government had actually forgotten that he existed. Of course, they did. Um, they, like, they went and they, uh, they executed his mom. So, so, after the Montagnards came to power, they executed, uh, Marie Antoinette, his mom, and then they just kind of forgot that he was there, and he ended up spending six months in his room in, uh, like a, some, I can't remember what, there's a prison in Paris, uh, he just ended up getting locked in this room. The prison guards didn't know who was in there. They just knew a prisoner was in there. And so they just brought him food every day. But didn't bother, like, talk to him or do anything. And so this, again, like, an eight, nine-year-old... Sh- 
It's like knowing they need to be locked up or refusing to look into why they're locked up. Right. They didn't even realize it was a kid in there. They just knew there's a prisoner in this one particular room and that they needed to bring him food. And so they just kept bringing him food. This kid went without human contact at the ages of eight and nine for about six months straight. God damn. No human contact. And the last thing that he experienced when before he entered this period where he didn't have any human contact, the last thing he did was that he was forced to go to trial and act as a witness against his own mother who was up for up at trial for betraying the French nation and would end up being convicted and sentenced to be guillotined. So essentially what it, you're saying is this guy is fi- fucked up psychologically beyond belief? Oh yes, fucked up psychologically, and as it turns out, fucked up medically because of, you know, living in a prison without supervision for six months, the kid ends up dying of some sort of, like, fucking blood condition or something. God damn. Yeah, and so after he dies, he was he was the only son of Louis the Sixteenth. Uh, the monarchists still consider him to be to have become the king after Louis the Sixteenth died, and so they called him Louis the Seventeenth. And then after he died, because <laughs> I'm sorry, that's not funny, but just the the irony makes it. Oh yeah, it's it's kind of dumb that he got he got called Louis the Seventeenth, even though he never sat on the throne once in his entire life, because again, he was ten. But they called him Louis the Seventeenth. He died. The only other, the next in line for the throne, was that kid's uncle, Louis the Sixteenth, brother, who is also named Louis for some fucking reason. <laughs> and he became Louis the Eighteenth. So after Napoleon was deposed, Louis the Eighteenth comes to the throne, and that's how the Bourbon dynasty is re- restored to power in France. No parliament. No representative democracy no reforms none of that horse shit it is now back to the government is back to the way it was in 1789 before the revolution began so what you're saying is they made all this progress then went all the way back to the beginning yep fuck france fuck france so after forming the restored monarchy the powers of europe uh, they convened a meeting in Vienna. It can be called the Congress of Vienna. And they started discussing how the rest of Europe would end up being divided in order uh, in order to ensure ensure further stability and balance of power. It was directed by the, the recently appointed prime minister of Vienna, this guy named, uh, I think, his last name was Metternich. That's the name everybody knows is von Metternich. Um, and uh, he Metternich is kind of a genius in his own way Uh, he was a really good statesman and a really good diplomat and he was very staunchly conservative and anti-revolutionary and he had this idea for what like a restored conservative sort of reactionary anti-revolutionary Europe would look like and it was every country has an absolute monarch every absolute monarch would have a certain amount of power and authority within europe and the power of of all of the other monarchs would check the power of individual monarchs preserve the balance of power within europe and keep another giant war across the entire continent from breaking out like this just through this carefully balanced power structure within all of europe that was his idea and that's what he was trying to accomplish here with the congress of vienna so Back to Napoleon. By all accounts, his life in, on Elba, it, he was a good king of Elba. He, he was a really good ruler. Everybody really, everybody in Elba really liked him. Because within the first few months that he was there, he already passed a bunch of different reforms. Um, like, he wasn't, he wasn't just taking this as like a, a... He didn't see this as like a prison sentence. He saw that there were, like, actual people here with, like, actual needs and stuff like that. And he still had his own idea of, like, leaving his mark somewhere. And so he decided to bring all these reforms that he had been doing all across Europe. You know, he's already here. He's got the power. He might as well bring those same reforms to Elba. Um, 
And so that that's what he did. He he began for the first thing he did was he built an army for this little island country. <laughs> The island was 700 soldiers strong. An island with 700 soldiers? Damn. Yeah, there were there were about 12,000 total people on this island. A huge percentage of their island is fucking soldiers now. Yeah, and, and apparently because it was Napoleon who was drilling them, they were pretty well trained, actually. They were pretty... They seemed to be... To, to have done pretty well in a fight. Um, uh, they... After that, he began developing like the local economy and the infrastructure. He started building new roads. He invested a bunch of money into the uh, into like the local coal and iron mines. Uh, he reformed the legal system along the line of like his Napoleonic, like, like his civil codes. Um, the only and he was doing really good. He was he's doing his same old workaholic thing that he always did. Uh, the only disruption was that a couple months into his exile on Elba, he received word from Paris that his his ex-wife, his first wife, Josephine, who, by the way, he was still madly in love with. You mentioned that he would be in love with her since till the end of her death. Yeah, uh, she died. Ooh. Yeah, he found out she died. Um, he was distraught. He cried like a baby in front of his entire court. Uh, he locked himself in his bedroom for two days with refusing to talk to anybody. Got his, his, his tears out, cried, cried his, got his emotions out. Walked out of his bedroom with a fresh uniform, looking clean, well-shaven. Went, got himself some food because he hadn't eaten in two days. And was good as new, got right back to work. Just the kind of guy that Napoleon was. He lost the love of his life. He found out the love of his life was dead. He sounds insane. He's just... The, here's the way that I've heard him described before. The, it, his real genius was his ability to compartmentalize. And I think we talked about the same thing with, actually with Frederick um, during his episode. I feel like it, you can argue this for a lot of great figures in history is their ability to compartmentalize. Yeah. Yeah, and, and Napoleon was another guy who was kind of an expert at this kind of thing. He could he was as he was an expert at organizing his own thoughts, and so as a result, he was also an expert at organizing the things around him. And uh and so and so yeah, he he found out that the love of his life had died. He got, he, his brain did some, like some sub subconscious calculations and was like, okay, we can cry this out and get these emotions out in the next two days. Once we're done with that, we can get back to work. And so that's exactly what he did. He, he play, he plotted like a schedule for himself. He planned out, okay, I'm going to do, I'm going to cry my eyes out for two days, refuse to work. And then once I'm done with that, I'm going to, uh, get a fresh uniform on, go get some food to eat, and then get right back to work. That's just that's just how his brain worked. If only it were that easy. Yeah. And so after that, it was just it was just smooth sailing. It was quiet. There was there wasn't much going on. He Napoleon Bonaparte, he settled down to his new situation. He he accepted his lot in life. He remained a fair, just ruler while he was in exile, and he died peacefully in his sleep, and history marched on without him. Hated by many, but beloved by those who knew him best. Yeah, that's the best way to describe it, to be honest. Knowing what you do about Napoleon, do you believe that what I just, do you believe what I just told you? Do you believe that that's how his life ended? Knowing how anticlimactic deaths can be, Yes. You think he just rolled over and accepted his exile? I mean, it's probably wasn't how it actually turned out. But like, if you want to be like from a historical complex and be like, yeah, they resisted it, but the resistance didn't really equal to nothing. So you can just say he rolled over and died. Yeah, I, I assume it's one of those more historical summarizations rather than an accurate thing. Yeah, yeah, you could say that. Like, that would make perfect sense in 
any other situation in any other context. That is a perfectly understandable thing to happen in history. Sometimes things just stop happening. And that's that's just how history works sometimes. Napoleon is not like every other part of history. Napoleon is his own fucking thing. And I am fucking with you right now. That is not the end of his story. That is not how he died. This man came, is going to come back to power in France. The fuck? He's bouncing back. He, he came to power in France by bouncing back from career-ending situations over and over and over again. We're three hours in and he's going to bounce back? He is about to bounce back. He's got one last trick to pull out, and I'm going to tell you right now. One last hurrah. One last hurrah. I'm going to tell you all about it. It's the greatest fucking thing that's ever happened in history. God damn. He did not die on Elba. This is not his last time in France. This is not the last time he's ever going to be emperor. I'm going to tell you about it now. In early 1815, just half a year after, into his exile. Half a year, just a few months, a little over six months, he started hearing rumors that the Congress of Vienna was discussing the idea of removing him permanently from the picture by getting him as far away from Europe as they possibly could. They were going to strip him of all of his titles. They were going to ship him off to an island in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. He heard about this and he said, no fucking thank you. He gathered all of his closest aides and companions and the 700 soldiers that he had trained on the island. He stole a ship packed them all onto the ship, and then he sailed it to the southern coast of France in Feb on February 26, 1815. As soon as he showed up back on French soil, word spread all across the continent as quick as wildfire that Napoleon Bonaparte was back on French soil and everybody lost their fucking minds. King Louis XVIII freaked the fuck out. The Congress of Vienna freaked the fuck out. The court in London freaked the fuck out. Just the mere presence of this man on European soil was enough to make the entire continent collectively shit its pants. <laughs> I fucking love that. It, and so Louis XVIII, scared, now scared for his life and for his throne, thinking he's about to end up exactly like his brother did, he sent out the 5th Regiment, about 4,000 men strong, to confront and arrest Napoleon. And the two sides, Napoleon and the 5th Regiment, that was led by Marshal Ney, who had served under Napoleon for the entirety of his rule, and, had, and after Napoleon was deposed, had declared fealty to Louis XVIII, declared his loyalty to the new Bourbon crown. He showed up to his former emperor, who he knew personally, with a, a unit of 4,000 soldiers to confront his former emperor and to arrest him. On March 15th, 1815, near the city of Grenoble. Now, for this part, there are two stories about what happened next. And I, I swear to God, this entire sequence... This entire period after he comes back from exile sounds like a fucking movie. And I need to I need to tell you now, this all really happened. This is the best picture that historians have been able to put together for what happened from this point going forward. It all sounds like a movie. But it, I promise you 100% it is all 100% historically accurate. So... There's two stories about what happened next. They're not entirely sure, but they're fairly sure which one actually happened. Because there's one that Napoleon himself told, which sounds more believable. It's the more likely sounding of the two. But again, we're talking about Napoleon. What's likely to happen is not what does happen. Obviously. But this is the story Napoleon told, and it sounds a little more believable. And then there's the story that literally everybody else present told about what happened. And that is the that is the story that is accepted by most pretty much every modern historian. So we can be fairly sure it's more or less the truth, but it is also the story that sounds like it is the climax of an action movie. It sounds like some movie studio bullshit is what you're saying? Yes, it sounds like a bad poorly written action script 
Hit me with it. So, Napoleon, Napoleon himself, he claims that when confronted by this regiment of troops, he rode up by himself. He left his little contingent of troops behind him. He rode up on a horse on his own, came up in front of the soldiers, hopped off his horse, and then he just walked up to this line of soldiers that were there to arrest him, and he just started, you know, giving them some basic, like, inspections. Like, he started, he started inspect... <laughs> to the balls on this man. He started in... Yeah, he started inspecting their uniforms, he started inspecting their muskets, he started making small talk with them, kind of like making jokes with them and stuff like that, which is all stuff that he regularly did when he was emperor. Whenever he was commanding an army, this is the kind of stuff that he would do because it ingratiated him to his men. It made his men really like him. And this is the same shit. And all of these men had served under him when he was emperor. So these were his former men, is what you're saying? Yeah, and so he was just doing the same thing he always did. Now, that's one story. That's the story Napoleon told. That's a story that most likely did not happen. Okay. The story that did happen um, is that he rode up on his horse, stopped about 30 yards out from the soldiers. And as he approached, all of the soldiers, all 4,000 of them pretty much, all lowered their muskets and pointed it right at his chest. There are 4,000 muskets ready to blow 4,000 brand new holes right through his fleshy, pudgy body. And he hops off his horse, takes a few steps towards his men, towards these men who are there to arrest him or even possibly just kill him. And he approaches them slowly. He has both hands outstretched to each side of his body. And he calls out to all of his men in his really loud commander voice that he would use on the battlefield. He shouts at them, would you kill your emperor? If you will, then here I am. And then there's dead silence. Not a single one of them fires a shot. Not a single word is said. And then all of a sudden, one of the men in the crowd, one of the men in the line, the regiment, shouts, Vive l'Empereur! Which is French for Long Live the Emperor. And then the entire regiment crowds, drops their muskets, crowds around him, and picks them up and puts them on their shoulders. And they start carrying him around, proclaiming him once again emperor of the french and proclaiming their loyalty to him now and forever that's the story that 99 percent almost definitely happened that actually happened damn i either way either story napoleon now had around a four thousand to five thousand man army damn just like that just a few days of landing on the on french soil so Louis found out all his men had defected, and so he sent an even larger force to confront him and to arrest him. They defected too. He sent a larger force, and then they defected. And over and over and over again, every single unit that that Napoleon came across, they immediately defected, and they immediately joined him in his march. And he was marching north all the way across France until he got to Paris. Before he got to Paris, Louis and his family realized what the fuck was happening. And so they all fled. And so once again, the Bourbons were knocked off of the throne of France. Damn. And Napoleon arrived in Paris and once again was proclaimed Emperor of the French on March 20th, 1815. God damn, this man's got a luck streak. He is back in power. He is Emperor again. <laughs> Actually did it. <laughs> this sudden... The son of a bitch, he doesn't... He doesn't quit. People, this doesn't happen. This doesn't happen in history. This never happens. And so upon finding out about this, the Congress of Vienna, literally the collection of representatives of every single major power in all of Europe, they declare him an outlaw. And they declare war on Napoleon Bonaparte. They don't... Cl they, now, they make a point. They specifically say they're not declaring war on France. They're not declaring war on the government of France. The entirety of Europe is declaring war on one single man. All of the most powerful governments, possibly on the entire planet at this point, are declaring war on a single man because he is so individually such a threat to them. And so that is how the War of the Seventh Coalition begins. 
Another fucking shot. God damn. Are you trying to kill me, my brother? <laughs> I promise this is the last one. I figured. You got it ready? Uh, just one second. And there we go. Prost. Cheers. He returns to the throne, the emperorship of the French. He has an army that is 200,000 strong. And this this is where it all goes downhill again. He sets up. He sets out from Paris and he invades Belgium. How does it go back downhill? <laughs> no, he just uh he, his army's not in a good state. They're still recovering from the war from all of the other wars. Uh, they're still pretty fresh faced. They're dealing with an administration that was heavily like like a bu- a bureaucracy and an army structure that was heavily affected by the overthrow of the Bonapartes. Um, and so it, it's just it's a it's a slightly smaller army. It's a slightly weakened army, and he's now facing a much more okay. confident and veteran and skilled. A coalition army against him so he sets out from paris he invades belgium and after a little bit of maneuvering he confronts a combined british and prussian force the british part is command commanded by a name you've probably heard before um arthur wellesley the duke of wellington yep i've heard of the duke of wellington i haven't heard his real name but i've heard the duke of wellington and the prussian the prussian side is is uh, commanded by Prince Gebhard Lebrecht von Blücher. And on June 18, 1815, near the town of Waterloo, they finally meet. Despite Napoleon being outnumbered, the Battle of Waterloo was actually a close-fought thing. Napoleon nearly won. Damn. But at the last minute, when it looked like the British lines might actually not be able to penetrate uh, French defenses... Um, von Blucher's reinforcements showed up and shattered the French line and forced them into retreat. The French army fell apart and Napoleon fled all the way back to Paris. And once he got back to Paris, he realized that the coalition army was soon on his tail. He heard word that uh, the Prussians, the Prussian soldiers had orders to shoot him on sight. And so once he was back in Paris, he abdicated his throne for a second time, and then he surrendered himself to the British. His second stint as emperor lasted a total of 110 days. Not even half a year. Sounds pathetic to me. I mean... I mean, the fact that he could do it is pretty actually impressive, but like... Yeah, considering the circumstances, that is better than anybody else could have done in his position. So, once again, removed from power, Louis res- Louis the 18th was restored to power. And this time the British were taking no chances. They sent Napoleon way the fuck away. No more titles, no more sovereignty, no more no more potential for him to ever return to Europe. Good. They sent him to the island of St. Helena, which is St. Helena is a little speck of dirt in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. It's in the southern hemisphere, south of the equator, about halfway between South Africa or South America and the continent of Africa. It was a it was just a little little island that the British happened to control. They sent him there, they placed him under house arrest in a rotting wood house with a couple of uh, assistants to help him live. And that is where he lived for the rest of his life. And being serious now. How long did he live after that? Uh, For six years. Six years on a, like, essentially, like, isolated island. Damn. It wasn't completely isolated. There were about 2,000 people. I said essentially, not literally. He was, yeah, he was, especially him, he was essentially isolated. He only had a few people that he was allowed to actually, like, interact with on a daily basis because he was under house arrest. He wasn't actually allowed to leave this building. Um, So he spent the remainder of his life writing his memoirs. He also wrote a book. uh, He he wrote a history of Julius Caesar, who is still his his greatest hero and inspiration. Um, He learned English. He had one of his assistants teach him English. And he played cards. And other than that, he just lived in a depressed fog, a depressed fog, uh, lonely with deteriorating mental health. 
in February of 1821, he fell sick and he became bedridden. And during his illness, he con- he decided to convert back to the Catholicism that he was raised with. He had been out of the church and he had a very uh, unstable relationship with the church during his reign because uh, at one point he did act kind of kind of sort of overthrow the pope and hold him hostage that was something the fuck yeah that was something i had to kind of skip over because it wasn't important in the grand scheme of his role but it did happen how do you skip over overthrowing the pope that is not even the most controversial thing i skipped over in this guy's life i you need to understand just to be able to get this these two episodes as short as i did i had to skip over some really like incredible stuff I imagine if you skipped over the fucking Pope getting overthrown. Yeah, uh, how do you think he made his son the King of Rome? I didn't even think of the logistics of that, no. Yeah, he had to get the Pope out of him. But yeah, now that he was on basically his deathbed, um, he reconciled with the church. Uh, he received his last, he, he gave his last confession, he received his last communion. And he received his last rites. And he, does, and he died in the full grace and love of the Lord, our Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for us and whose representative, the, the descendants of St. Peter, the successors of Peter, who rule in the, the Vatican and Rome, yada, 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 whatever. Um, yeah, so after that, he died in his bed on May 5th, 1821. He was 51 years old. His last words were, quote, France... L'armée, tête d'armée, Josephine. Or in English, he just, he was, he was kind of senile and kind of ranting in his last moments alive. He's just saying random stuff. But his last words were France, the army, head of the army, Josephine. His last, his last word was Josephine. He's still in love with that girl, isn't he? He's still in love with his first wife who he intentionally divorced for political reasons. God damn. So after he died, an autopsy was conducted in order to discover the cause of death. Initially, the doctor ruled his cause of death uh, stomach cancer, which was very well possible because they did find uh, ulcers in his stomach. And his father died of stomach cancer as well. So that was 100% a possibility. Um, Some modern scholars believe that it might have also it might have been arsenic poisoning, and there were two possible places that he could have gotten arsenic poisoning. One was that arsenic was a compound that was used in the wallpaper in the the house where he lived on Saint Helena, and the second one is that he was intentionally given to it by his British captain. That they intentionally poisoned him in order to hasten his death. Um, so it was either arsenic poisoning or stomach cancer. It was one of the two. We don't know which one it was. Could have been both. Could have been neither. Could have been one of them. Honestly, no idea. Um, Also, during the autopsy, the doctor who was conducting the autopsy, um, he stole Napoleon's penis. The fuck? Yeah, this guy uh, cut the the emperor of France's penis off and uh, kept it in a jar. He took it with him somewhere. It's now lost to history. The fuck would you do that for? Who knows? Nobody knows. But he did. And now it's lost. Nobody knows where it is. God damn. I was not ready for that, Derek. Yeah, I intentionally made it as uh, as uh, shocking, as like out of left field as possible. Now, now I want a clause in my fucking will that says my dick stays a part of me. I think that's fine to put in your will. I just don't think that anybody's going to be interested in your dick after you're gone. In Napoleon's will, he requested that his body be returned to France and that he be buried on the banks of the Seine River, which is the river that it's the river that passes through Paris. Was that honored or did they tell him to fuck off? Absolutely not. No, the British are complete pieces of shit. (laughs) The British government said, Nope, bury the fucker on the Island. (laughs) (laughs) As, as, as deserved to be honest. I don't know. We're thinking, were they scared if they brought him back to France, he'd rise out of his coffin and retake the throne? I don't... I, t- I just figure it's an honor that he doesn't really deserve. I guess. I guess that's, that was their thinking, too. Or they just didn't want to bother wasting the 
wasting the trip to get a ship there to transport his body. Um, but yeah, that's what they do. They bury him on the island. Um, then later on in 1840, the French government was able to get his body returned to France, where um, they finally, the French government finally held a state funeral for him. I love how he's brought up as like a massive figure in history, but no one talks about the dishonor he went through at the end. Yeah, yeah. It, uh, I don't know. I think yeah, like all of the like the battle battle of Austerlitz kind of overshadows like uh, playing cards in a drafty house on an island in the middle of the Atlantic. I think. I think. I think that's the the part of his life that most people are concerned about. But yeah, I get what you're saying though. Well, it, it just paints like a false figure of history when they don't like at least give some kind of context. Oh, he died in shame. Like, there's plenty of hit characters throughout history that we, like, don't go into the context of how their life ended. So, like, uh, George Washington's a good example. After he retired, so after George Washington retired from politics, he was incredibly senile. And he spent the last few years of his life uh, desperately hunting down one of his slaves that had escaped. Um, she had fled, like, up to Maine and... And George Washington became convinced that the reason that she had fled from slavery was because she had been seduced by some sort of like like surly Frenchman. He became convinced that there was just this random French guy who had seduced his slave and convinced her to run away and abandon the Washington family. It's not like slavery was bad and like fucked with people psychologically, physically, and mentally and like was actually just a piece of shit over... Uh, um, societal structure that we should have never started to begin with. Yeah, yeah, and so this is that was what was occupying his mind as uh, in 1799 when he wandered out in when his old ass grin like in his like his 80s wandered out into the snow and started cutting wood and then came back in with a cold and then died of pneumonia. <laughs> That was on his. That was on his mind. Was like wondering how he was going to hunt down and kill this mysterious Frenchman who had seduced his slave to, um, to kidnap her away to Maine. And this is why we should not idolize people, y'all. Yeah, it's so fucking stupid. Um, yeah. So, so Napoleon, he's finally returned to France in 1840. They finally have a state funeral for him, and they temporarily bury him in the crypt in St. Jerome's Cathedral um, because at the time they were building like this entire, they were renovating this old historical building in Paris and rebuilding it to create, to build into his own independent tomb. And so he was interred in a, in a big fancy elaborate sarcophagus made of a solid block of red quartz. And his sarcophagus, his body with this inside the sarcophagus, was placed under the dome in the build, in a building called Le, Le Invalides in Paris, which is it's just an old historic building in Paris. It was renovated specifically to hold his tomb, and that's and it's still open today. You can still go and see Napoleon's sarcophagus in Paris right now if you want. Um, it's something I'd like to see eventually. Eventually, yeah, same. Yeah, um, th- there's a lot of things I would love to see eventually, but knowing like uh, the way our economy is balanced, it will probably never get to go see. Yeah, his tomb was designed in such a way that it would be it would, it was open to visitors. It was open to anybody who could come in and come and see the sarcophagus and see where Napoleon's body rests. Um. But it was specifically designed so that there were only two ways that you could view the sarcophagus. So it's this just rounded off room. There's a ground level and then there's a veranda up above the, uh, above the sarcophagus. And the sarcophagus itself is placed in the center of the room about halfway between ground. It's set up on a platform about halfway between ground level and the bottom of the veranda. So if you come into the tomb at ground level then you're forced to look up to see the sarcophagus but if you're up on the veranda then you're forced to bend over the railing so that you can look down at at the sarcophagus 
and it was specifically designed that way so that anybody so that the only way that you could possibly view napoleon's body was either if you're looking up at him in awe or if you are bowing to him that's prickish that that's yeah that's that's kind of fucking stupid but i think it's kind of cool <laughs> i think that's some clever design honestly <laughs> that I, I don't know. I th- I think it's I think it's silly, but at the same time, like I kind of admire it in a weird way. But I, it takes balls, but it's still a dick move. So yeah, that is that is Napoleon. That is Napoleon the man story. But he, the story doesn't just none of these stories ever just end with the man. They continue on after, long after he's gone. Um, Napoleon's legacy is, suffice it to say, a complicated one. Even more complicated than... I'd, I'd venture to argue Napoleon's legacy is more complicated than any other person that we've ever discussed on this show. I wouldn't disagree. Yeah, depending on who you ask, he's either one of the greatest heroes who's ever lived in all of human history, or he's just one step removed from Hitler. Um, in France, whether you like him or not, he's considered a figure who represents the French nation and French nationalism and a period of French power and might. And to some French people, he's kind of looked back on fondly as like a time when France had more power and prestige and authority, that kind of stuff. Um, after the revolutions of 1848, Napoleon's nephew, Louis Napoleon Bonaparte, would be elected president of the newly founded Second French Republic. <laughs> it, it's weird how, like, nepotic it feels history is, but, like, that's kind of how people view it. Like, oh, it's this, the relative of this person that we knew did this thing we liked, even if, like, it wasn't overall seen as good history plays i mean that's how bush jr got into the presidency in my opinion it's like oh bush senior did a good job and he's running on similar politics i'll vote for him but yeah after the revolutions of 48 uh louis napoleon bonaparte was elected president of the newly founded second french republic in no small part because of name recognition because people were nostalgic for Napoleon's rule. They really liked that time when France couldn't lose. Um, until they did, of course. But. That's how it works. You're, you keep winning until you lose, and everyone thinks the winning streak will never end. Um, when Louis Napoleon lost his re-election bid, uh, he launched a coup and overthrew the Republic. Damn, Louis Napoleon was ballsy. Yeah, he proclaimed himself, or he pro- proclaimed the second French empire and proclaimed himself emperor Napoleon the third. Of course. Um, notice there's no second. Yeah. The second was Napoleon's infant son. Napoleon, like Napoleon one's infant son. The one that technically had right of rulership after Napoleon was removed from power, but like didn't actually rule. Yeah. Yeah, the one... Right, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's the exact same shit as Louis the Seventeenth. In Napoleon's date of Corsica, he's generally viewed negatively because he was a, you know, he was a traitor to Corsican independence. Um, in Germany and in Britain, he's generally remembered as kind of a warmonger who threatened peace in Europe, which is kind of ironic coming from the Germans, but we're not going to get into that right now. It's ironic for, like, considering how more mongering a lot of countries' histories are. Right, yeah. Um, In Spain, of course, Napoleon is absolutely fucking reviled. He's considered one of the worst villains in history by the Spanish because of the crimes and the massacres that he carried out and that the French army carried out during the Peninsular War. Because, as it turns out, counterinsurgencies are actually incredibly fucking violent it involves a lot of murdering civilians but then on the other side of the spectrum in poland napoleon is a hero he's a he's like 
an unofficial symbol of Polish independence. They even mention, like I mentioned before, the Polish national anthem mentions Napoleon by name. Damn. Um, besides, like, national identity, just in politics in general, on the right wing of politics, a lot of right wingers, like the far right, either sees Napoleon as, like, a strong symbol of, like, national vigor and, like, military prowess. Or he's hated because he's the man who destroyed the old order of feudal Europe. And then on the left, of course, he's either viewed as like a tyrannical reactionary who betrayed the ideals of revolution for, for personal power, or specifically in the Marxist tradition, he's seen as like this terrible force of history who was thrust into prominence to to resolve the contradictions of France's revolutionary society. Um, one of Karl Marx's greatest works, one of his most famous books that he ever wrote, was an analysis comparing Napoleon to his nephew, Napoleon III, in a book titled The 18th Brumaire of Louis Napoleon. Interesting. Um, in this book, we get one of Marx's most famous quotes, probably the quote that he's most commonly associated with right behind the one from the Communist Manifesto about a specter haunting Europe. This is probably his second most famous quote. Quote, Hegel remarks somewhere that all great world historic facts and personages appear, so to speak, twice. He forgot to add, the first time as tragedy, the second time as farce. Yeah. And basically what he's saying there is that Napoleon's rule was a tragedy, Napoleon III's rule was a farce. Which it was. Yeah. Um, in concrete terms, besides anybody's opinion, his influence on the human race has been immeasurable. We cannot, we'll never be able to comprehend the true effect that his life had on the course of human history. Uh, there's no way to actually quantify it, to be honest. Right. The Napoleonic Codes are now the basis for over a quarter of all of the legal systems on the entire planet. Um, his reforms throughout Europe completely destroyed the last vestiges of feudalism left over from the Middle Ages. His rule over Europe marked the end of all feudalism in Europe. And his reforms, his economic reforms, allowed for the growth of industrial capitalism and the growth of the middle class, or in you know Marxist terms, the growth of the bourgeoisie and the petty bourgeoisie, setting the stage for future revolutionary periods, and eventually the development of different ideas such as like, you know, socialism, communism, anarchism, fascism. Uh, to some extent, like nation, just nationalism in general, he his rule started all of that. He, he set the stage for that. His military forms are probably the most obvious ones. He completely changed the shape of warfare in every conceivable way. Strategy, tactics, organization, technology, domestic policy, industry. Every Western army in the world every every european american latin american just anywhere that was touched by european technology and european warfare was forced to ad adopt his ideas in the eight, early 1800s or they would fall behind and they would be the staple of they would be the standard for organizing military structures all the way up until they ran headfirst into modern industrial technology in the trenches of World War I, at which point they became obsolete. Uh, during the, in our own country, during the American Civil War, generals on both sides were organizing and commanding their armies in the style of Napoleon Bonaparte's armies. That's the legacy of Napoleon. It's a lot of complicated shit. It's a lot of isn't that exactly how it, not literally, but like, it's complicated. Isn't that how Alexander was? Like, it's complicated. Like, yeah, he did a lot of things that we, if he didn't do, we would not be anywhere near where we are today. Even if you wanted to say, like, we still would have made progress. We wouldn't be in the exact situation we would today. Um, 
Like, that's a lot of historical fixtures. They, they did some fucked up shit, but if they didn't do that fucked up shit, we would look completely different, whether good or bad, and sometimes both. Right, yeah. It's it, Trying to apply morality to history is like... It, it's trying to fit a square peg into a round hole. Humanity and human history is not moral actors. We're material actors. We act on circumstance and we act on motivation and we act on personality and it's not always moral and it doesn't always turn out the way people want but it happens in the ways that it does and for better or for worse there are lessons there are always lessons to learn from them so what what do i think personally about napoleon and his legacy i think I think he was a brilliant man. And I think he was a man who had an ego to match his brilliance, who had amazing skills in very specific areas and very specific specialties that caused him to be able to be in the right places at the right times in order to exert his will on history, which is just as he always intended. It's something he had always planned for. It's something that he was ready to do when the time came for him. Sounds about right, yeah. And in the position he did, he did all, in the position that he had, he did all of the things that came with the job, both good and bad. He's a force of history. A, a Definitely. A fascinating, incredible, wonderful, important force of history who pushed for better or worse, humanity in a completely new direction. And that is, that's what I've got on Napoleon Bonaparte. What are you, what are you, what are your thoughts? What are you thinking about right now? I, it sounds like I view him very similar to Alexander the Great. And I don't mean like in the same level of feats because like, I feel like Alexander the Great did a lot more stuff where like we would be in a fundamentally different position where we would I, again even again it would be that with alex with um napoleon too but like i feel like the the stark differences if both characters were are completely opposite directions or like like alexander's would be orders of magnitude difference if you get what i'm saying like yes they fundamentally laid the groundwork for where we're at today whether or not you want to argue it's good or bad. Like they, it laid the groundwork for where we're at today because even the bad stuff led to like, Oh, we don't want to repeat that. Or the, the, the parts that we can use, we repeated on our own or people learn from that. But like, it, it's just really like one of those fucked up things in history that you hate to put it that way. Kind of had to happen. Right. Yeah. It's, it's some shit that's, so much fucked up shit happened because as a direct result of Napoleon, both for things that he deliberately did and things that happened just as a result of him having done the things he did. And it's like you don't want to compliment or like acknowledge how like quote unquote good they did, but you you kind of have to because you're like, yeah, it, it fundamentally changed the landscape of the world both him and Alexander, like a lot of the topics we've talked about, like not all of them, but like Frederick the great fundamentally, if he wasn't there, it would have changed the landscape of history. I feel like Ethan Allen, if he wasn't there, it, it, America might not be the same kind of union that it is today. Like our, our structure might've changed. Yeah. Yeah. I think America, like it, it, it wouldn't, I don't think it'd be like super, super different, but like there, America wouldn't look exactly the same. It does today without Ethan Allen. Um, like it, it's, it's just like sitting there and looking at people who like feel like they're in their own niche of history, but realizing their repercussions are like vastly, vastly far spread. It, it's, it, it really makes you think, what is my repercussions as just an average citizen going to look like in the future? If you're able to, if there's an afterlife, like let, we're not going to get into that, but like, are you able to see the overview of your actions in history when you die? Would, it makes you curious at what that's going to look like in 10 years after you death, a hundred years, 200 years. Like it, it really makes you curious. Like, because like 
I bet you he didn't think he was going to be a big deal at like at certain parts of his life. Like some people who had a big history, like impact. Like I bet you Ethan Allen didn't think he was going to be remembered. Like he he was doing shit he believed in, but he didn't think he was going to be like a big deal and like actually have replications on like the U.S. his shape. Yeah, yeah, and that, that's the that's the thing about Napoleon though is that I he definitely knew because he was a ruler, but like. It's. St- I still bet he had no idea how much he would shape human history. Yeah, yeah. I, I. It. It makes me really think, and it makes me really wonder. Like there at the end of his life on Saint Helena, like, did he know for a fact that his leadership would have such a profound effect on, at the very least, European history, or did he just did did he? Th- what did he think that maybe like everything that he had done would just be undone by reaction would be undone by the, the coalition and by the Bourbon dynasty. They just come in and they'd uproot everything that he had done and nothing would be left of his legacy. I, I really wonder like what, what his thoughts were, what he thought would be left of himself after he died. It, honestly, it's unknowable. Like to be honest, without like, going into the afterlife and being able to speak to him but like everything i know about the afterlife says he's in hell like i'm not i'm not i'm not trying to push morality but like he if if anything we know about like the afterlife is true he's probably in hell like i'm not trying to like pass moral judgment like there's no way he's anywhere else and i'm saying that as like i'm confident i'm going to hell like if there is a like that or at least purgatory but like purgatory at best is like where I'm going. Like I, 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 I've accepted that. I was about to say, any last thoughts before we go, Derek? Yeah, just uh, it, it's figures like Napoleon, guys like Napoleon. Those stories are the reason that I love studying history so much. It's I, I don't blame you on this because it's it's such a nuanced topic, and you can't really attribute. It like some things that you would think would be attributable to malice modernly, you can't say that back then because even if you know the historical context, there are so many like small little nuances that could change whether it was attributed to malice or not that you may not know. Yeah, yeah, and when I'm when I'm deep in the weeds because it, I'm I'm generally a pretty opinionated person. Anybody who's followed me on Twitter will know, or who knows me in real life will know, I'm a pretty opinionated person. History is one of those things where, like, I recognize that my opinion doesn't mean much of shit. It, it, it doesn't. Like, we can look at history and we can interpret it ten days from Sunday. And we're probably wrong about at least nine out of t- ten different things because of the way history is, like... History is very much written by the victors and it, it, it's never accurate even if the person writing it is trying to be accurate. Yeah, yeah, and... And that's the thing is that like I can kind of leave my I don't need to worry about like moral gray areas. I can kind of leave my morality behind when I'm kind of trying to understand and comprehend these these topics because of because it's it's already set in stone. It's already happened. All I all I'm trying to do is to understand it to the greatest extent of truth that I can. Maybe Maybe once I have a, a full understanding of a topic, I might have like a moral opinion about it one way or another. But at the same time, it's already happened. It's already had its effect. And all I can do with the topic itself is just try to understand it and comprehend it. And hopefully, as is my passion, to pass it on to other people so that they can have a fuller, richer understanding of it as well. And that is, and theoretically, hopefully, avoid repeating it. Oh yeah, of course. And uh, Napoleon is the greatest sort of synthesis of that idea to me. Is he's not a man to be sympathized with or to be condemned. He's a man to be understood in times that are meant to be understood, so that we can understand where we've come from and where we can possibly go in the future. And that is all i need to know and i'm perfectly satisfied with that and i think that's all we need to say uh as long-winded as we've been 
about Napoleon. Um, what a what an incredible fucking story. <laughs> indeed. You want to go ahead and cite your sources again for the audience? Uh, yeah, so my, my main source was uh, the biography uh, Napoleon by Andrew Roberts. And uh, Tim, what else did we have? Uh, that's that's all I can think of with the podcast. Where can they find you on social media, Derek? But yeah, you can find me on Twitter at Visigot. The first I is a one, the O is a zero. Also, I'm very recently on uh, Blue Sky, the Twitter alternative at Visigoth at dot Blue Sky, whatever you you know what it is. Uh, the it's spelled different differently from the Twitter. Um, the all of the eyes are regular eyes, but the O is still a zero. Okay. And then they can find me at Tim, a.k.a. Otis, at Twitter.com, and hopefully somewhere similar on Blue Sky in the future. Um, and then they can find the podcast on Facebook and Instagram at The Alexander Society Pod and at Twitter at Alex Society Pod, Alexander Society on TikTok. If you enjoyed this episode, please give us a rate review on your streaming platform of choice, and we'll see you next time. All right. That's all we got. Bye.